This story is called Beware the Clawed One, from Mr. Nobody. Let's begin. This happened to me on 2019, September 24th. A handful of my friends and I had decided to visit the infamous Hell's Hollow Road in Connecticut. We had all heard the local tales of strange and terrifying things happening there, but we wanted to see for ourselves if there was any truth behind them. Our curiosity overcame our fear as we began our eerie adventure. On that first evening, it was all seemingly normal. Still, a feeling of unease tingled just beneath the surface as my friends Jeremy, Melissa, Francis, and I gathered at the entrance to the road. The dying trees and ravens cackling nearby gave us an unsettling welcome as darkness enveloped us. As we walked further into the shadows, laughing nervously at each other's frightened expressions, Francis suddenly hushed everyone. What he thought would be a simple night out with friends would soon prove to be anything but ordinary. We all stopped and listened in silence. The wind began to softly moan, and as it grew louder, the atmosphere became colder in a matter of seconds. Despite there being no breeze moments before, autumn leaves were now swirling around us as if caught in an invisible vortex. I think we should go back, Melissa muttered. Jeremy only chuckled in response. Come on, aren't you curious? What's a ghost hunt without a bit of ghostly wind? None of us could argue against his adventurous spirit. We pressed forward despite our growing trepidation. Then it happened, the gruesome discovery that would turn our light-hearted excursion into something straight out of our worst nightmares. About half a mile down that sinister path lay what appeared to be human bones strewn about on the damp earth. It seemed like whoever they belonged to had been torn apart by some kind of monstrous force. Sickened by the sight, we barely noticed the sounds of distressed animals echoing in the distance. We couldn't call for help because there was no phone reception, and we kept rationalizing that maybe all of this was a well-created hoax by teenagers or artists trying to scare the locals. Still, our hearts raced in tandem with each passing moment of eerie silence and unknown threats lurking within that dark abyss. By now, we thought we had seen the worst of it. Little did we know, something even more unspeakable lay just beyond our notice. In an instant that felt like slow motion, Melissa screamed as she spotted a grotesque mutilation of a former human being, barely recognizable hanging grotesquely on one of the few trees still standing. If this is a prank, it's gone too far, Jeremy exclaimed. We decided to turn back immediately and escape this haunted road. We couldn't take any more terror. As we hurried back to where our adventure had started, Francis suddenly caught sight of something hulking emerging from the dark fog that had begun to surround us. We knew at once that it wasn't another human. The massive silhouette moved on all fours with elongated limbs and horrifically distorted proportions. Its body was covered in coarse fur, with its once human teeth replaced by sharp canine fangs dripping with saliva, glinting under what little moonlight managed to pierce through the dense fog. Trembling with fear, we scrambled through a small pathway in the dense forest our only hope to outrun this monstrous abomination, as its guttural snarls grew closer behind us. As Jeremy helped Melissa around trees and vines, Francis glanced back over his shoulder towards me. Have you ever heard? He gasped between breaths. Of any werewolves in these parts? I shook my head while continuing to run as fast as I could muster. All I could think about was surviving this horrifying chase and escaping from Hell's Hollow with my life. But at the same time, another part of my mind screamed that there was no way we could outrun a monster like that, especially not when the fog was thickening and our vision was becoming more obscured. 
We continued sprinting, our shoes pounding against the damp earth. The monstrous creature was relentless in its pursuit, snarling and snapping at our heels. Look for a house or somewhere to hide. I shouted, struggling to keep up with the others. We had left our phones in the car because we didn't think there would be a need for them on what was originally just an innocent ghost hunt. Now, we desperately needed help, but there was nowhere to find it. We prayed that someone would hear our screams. Suddenly, Francis tripped over an exposed root and fell hard to the ground. Jeremy and Melissa stopped to help him up, but the creature was closing in too fast. Leave me! Francis screamed, scared beyond reason. Save yourselves! I'll try to hold it off. We hesitated for a second, unable to leave our friend behind. But Francis' tone left no room for argument. Jeremy and Melissa helped him up before continuing their desperate escape, leaving me and Francis facing the terrifying beast. The creature lunged at us with its massive claws extended. Francis swung a heavy branch like a baseball bat, connecting with a loud snap of timber upon bone as he hit the creature's arm. It recoiled momentarily before pouncing again with frightening speed. This time it managed to slash across Francis' leg, filling the air with pain-filled screams. He collapsed onto the ground while I managed to pull him away and into a crouched hiding spot within a narrow crevice between two large rocks. We heard faint cries from Jeremy and Melissa in the distance as they realized we were no longer with them but couldn't venture back without risking all of our lives. Within moments, heavy panting and sniffling filled the air. Our monstrous attacker was sniffing for its prey. In a whispered voice, I told Francis, We need to be quiet and still. Maybe it will leave. He nodded, gripping his injured leg, visibly biting back more screams of pain as we held our breaths. The creature circled our hidden spot for what felt like an eternity, snarling and growling in frustration. Eventually, it appeared to lose interest or hope in finding us and moved away. We remained silent and unmoving for another excruciatingly long stretch of time, making sure every step the creature took vanished into the distance. Finally, certain it had left, we emerged from our hiding place. We need to get back to the road, I said after helping Francis to his feet. Maybe there's a passing car or someone who can help us. Supported by each other, we limped back out of that nightmarish place as fast as our battered bodies would allow. We found Jeremy and Melissa farther down the road, anxiously waiting for us. What happened? How did you escape that thing? Jeremy asked when we were back together. It was a werewolf, I said breathlessly. I don't know how else to explain it. We got lucky this time. As we made our way slowly back towards the entrance of Hell's Hollow, bruised and terrified, I couldn't help but think about our narrow escape and how creatures from folklore could exist in real life. We would never be the same after this night, forever wondering if those bone-chilling howls carried by the wind were just ordinary wolves or something far more sinister hunting under the moonlit sky. This story is called The Gruesome Bite, from Enigmatic Quill. Let's begin. This happened to me on August 12th. Lennox McKee had always been a firm believer in logic and reason, scoffing at the very mention of supernatural phenomena. So when I received a frantic phone call from my neighbor Rebecca claiming that something unimaginable was lurking around our small, quiet town of Madison, Wisconsin, I couldn't help but suppress a chuckle. There was a savage attack at Mason's Park last night, 
Rebecca informed me as her breaths came in quick gasps. I remember thinking it was probably just some wild animals. We lived near a heavily wooded area, so deer and other creatures were not uncommon to happen upon. But what she told me next set chills down my spine. The police found body parts scattered all over the crime scene, but no animal prints. She whispered fearfully. The only trace they found were these odd scratch marks on a tree nearby, as if something had sharpened its claws. Despite myself, curiosity got the better of me, and I reluctantly agreed to accompany Rebecca to the park that evening to investigate ourselves. Just the thought of sneaking into an active crime scene had our adrenaline pumping. As night fell and we tiptoed towards Mason's Park, every rustle of leaves or whirring wind made our hearts race. Gradually, fear began settling into my veins, unearthing an unfamiliar anxiety within me. Silently weaving through the dense trees and shrubbery near the crime scene, we came across the claw marks Rebecca had mentioned on the phone earlier. I trailed my fingers along them, grimacing as thoughts of how those gashes could have been made made my skin crawl. Suddenly, from somewhere deep within the woods, came an ear-splitting howl, chillingly human-like yet undeniably animal at the same time. We exchanged terrified glances as our fright escalated, and without exchanging any words, we bolted towards the safety of our homes. On the way there, we encountered a small group of townspeople who had been rattled equally upon hearing the gut-wrenching howl. They spoke in the hushed voices of a creepy old man who'd recently moved into town and mostly kept to himself. No one seemed to know his origin or what compelled him to seek solitude. Later that week, reports of more gory attacks began surfacing. The ever-present sense of dread intensified with each new discovery, gnawing at me as I tried to make sense of the escalating violence. Rumors spread like wildfire amongst the townspeople as neighbors eyed one another with suspicion and paranoia. Some whispered about old legends concerning werewolves that had steadily taken root within our community but their fearful chatter only served to heighten my unease. With each passing day, tensions escalated, and residents barricaded themselves in their homes once night fell, fearful of meeting an untimely demise under the full moon's silver glow. It was late one evening when I found myself home alone, my family having left for an unforeseen emergency out of town. Diverted by the ominous news about yet another grisly attack reported nearby, I failed to hear it, a quiet scraping at the back door. The sudden intrusion snapped me back to reality. Pulse racing, I grabbed a knife from the kitchen counter just in case and cautiously approached the door. Then came a low scratching sound on the glass panes. My hands trembled at this intrusion into my sanctuary. I unlocked the door and peered outside, ready to confront whatever was making the noise. At first, I saw nothing. My eyes scanned the darkness of our backyard until they finally settled upon something, a bloodied shoe lying just a few feet away on the lawn. Thoughts of recent attacks rushed back to me, and I felt my heart thumping in my chest. By the time the police arrived, the scratching had long since subsided, leaving them with mere clues that didn't provide much help. They told me that, for my own safety, I should have left the house earlier. Nervously, I explained how my family was out of town and that calling them for help wasn't an option at the time. Over the next couple of days, things only grew worse as more bodies were discovered in our once peaceful town. Desperate cries for help echoed through dark streets at night as people tried to fend off an unknown menace that seemed to be ripping our community apart. The brutal scenes that met first responders were beyond anything they had ever experienced before. As we learned more about this mysterious attacker, 
something became apparent. It had a disturbing habit of leaving claw marks like the ones we saw in Mason's Park. Gashes on trees and doors followed suit, as if an angry beast were marking its territory. With no one feeling safe anymore, most people resorted to forming search groups to patrol their neighborhoods and protect their loved ones from harm. Many even armed themselves with weapons for self-defense, knives, baseball bats, and anything else they could find in their homes. One night during this period of chaos, I reluctantly agreed to participate in one of these neighborhood patrols alongside Rebecca and some other friends. We cautiously ventured down dark alleyways and through abandoned parks, hoping to avoid any confrontation but resolving to do whatever it took to protect our small community. It wasn't long before we stumbled upon a gory scene that would change everything. A severely injured man lay on the ground, struggling to breathe and unable to speak. Large, deep lacerations covered his body, telling us he had faced whatever we had all feared these last few days. As we administered first aid, his heart stopped, and we were left utterly shocked. Just when we thought the night couldn't get any worse, a howl pierced the air, similar to what Rebecca and I had experienced that night in Mason's Park. We knew then that we were close to the source of our terror and dread. We hesitantly continued our search, eventually finding ourselves near the creepy old man's residence who had moved into town weeks earlier. Knowing this could be our only chance, we decided to approach his small, secluded house. As we inched closer, an uneasy feeling washed over me. I kept thinking about all of the horrific attacks that had plagued our town in such a short span of time. Moments later, we heard unsettling growls followed by another blood-curdling howl as a large creature lunged out from behind a tree. It attacked those closest while the rest of us scrambled to escape. Soon after, the police arrested the eerie old man who had been watching all this unfold from a distance. It was later revealed that he wasn't just any eccentric hermit, but rather a werewolf who'd spent years living and killing undetected among humans. The Beast of Silver Lake, from Jackson 897 My life changed completely in April 2010. As a Green Beret, we were trained to face unexpected situations calmly and strategically, but nothing could have prepared me for what happened that month. Our mission took us to a remote place near Silver Lake, a beautiful yet eerie location veiled in secrecy and unexplained incidents. Locals who lived nearby didn't offer much help or information about the place. They just continued with their daily routines and seemed oblivious to the increasing tension among our team. The first day was ordinary and dull as we set up camp near the edge of the lake. We had no idea that the coming night would shatter any semblance of peace we had experienced. That night, as darkness crept in and enshrouded everything around us, it began. An inexplicable feeling of unease started to plague the camp, followed shortly by a distant scream. Or was it a roar? The otherworldly sound echoed through the trees, leaving us all with goosebumps. We assumed it was nothing more than a wild animal out hunting for food, but as more nights came and went without rest for our group, it became increasingly difficult not to feel terror settling in. After nearly a week at Silver Lake, it became evident that this was no ordinary forest. Strange things were happening all around us. Personal belongings went missing, unknown tracks left no trace of their origin, and whatever was making those horrific sounds continued playing cat and mouse with us. The tension among my teammates grew unbearable one morning when I stepped out of my tent only to find one member of our group missing. 
We scoured the surrounding woods for him with growing concern. Blood-spattered branches in nearby areas were the evidence of some kind of struggle or attack. As we searched endlessly for our missing comrade, we stumbled upon cloth shreds hanging from broken branches that resembled pieces of his uniform but nothing more. That night, our campfire conversations were filled with fear and confusion. Another incident appeared the following day. A bizarre symbol scrawled into the dirt close to where we slept. It was disturbingly twisted, but none of us knew what it represented or who could have drawn it there. Just as we thought things couldn't get any worse, they did, a discovery so foul that it would forever remain etched in our minds. We found the remains of our missing team member a few feet from camp. His body was twisted and mutilated beyond recognition. It was a sight unparalleled by anything I had witnessed throughout my service. The grim realization that our adversary wasn't human struck us like lightning as we stared in horrified silence at the mangled corpse before us. We had come face to face with an entity far beyond our comprehension, a beast from the depths of folklore. We decided to escape Silver Lake and alert authorities about the unimaginable nightmare we had been living through. That night was going to be our last in that cursed place if we could make it till dawn. However, our tormentor wouldn't let us exit that easily. As we finished packing up in haste, that eerie sound echoed once more through the forest, this time closer than ever before accompanied by the guttural snarl of an unseen monster right outside our camp's perimeter. Our hearts raced as adrenaline coursed through our veins, but this time we were not facing an enemy we'd ever encountered before. The fear of engaging with this unknown creature seemed insurmountable. The snapping of nearby branches and ground-shaking footfalls grew nearer, each deafening thump sending tremors throughout my entire body. Our plan was simple, leave everything behind, grab whatever weapons we could find, and flee towards civilization as fast as possible. We picked up whatever makeshift weapons we had and began running, leaving our camp behind. The sound of our heavy breaths and pounding hearts filled the air around us as we pushed forward, not daring to look back. The forest seemed never-ending, but the thought of getting as far away from the creature as possible motivated us to keep going. As we ran, I realized how impossible it was to call for help. Our phones had no signal in this remote forest, and no one knew our exact location. Our only hope was to reach civilization before the creature caught up with us. This realization made our escape even more urgent. We continued running until we reached a ravine with a fast-flowing river at the bottom. Jumping in seemed like a last resort, but it was a risk we were willing to take if it meant increasing the distance between us and the beast. The sound of snapping branches and guttural snarls came closer and closer as we edged towards the ravine. In one quick motion, each of us jumped into the river praying that it would carry us to safety. As I plunged into the icy waters, I felt myself being forcefully pulled downstream by the river's merciless current. After what seemed like an eternity of struggling against the water, my eyes caught sight of my teammates near a river bank further down, all accounted for except for our fallen comrade. Drenched and exhausted, we pulled ourselves onto dry land as fast as possible. We exchanged relieved glances before scanning our surroundings, hoping that whatever pursued us had left our trail. However, deep down, each of us knew that celebrating too soon would be a foolish mistake. Our luck continued when we were greeted by a passing group of hikers who'd been exploring nearby trails. We decided not to divulge every horrific detail of our ordeal but told them enough so they'd realize that an evil force was lurking in Silver Lake and the surrounding forest. 
The hikers, both concerned and intrigued by our story, had no choice but to continue in the same direction as us. This was their best chance of getting back to their own campsite as darkness began setting in. Safety was paramount, so we all banded together and attempted to find the nearest ranger station. With each step, we all knew that our ordeal might not be over yet. With increasing dread, we couldn't shake off the thought that the creature hunting us might still have more terrible acts to unleash. As we made our way through the woods, an eerie calm settled around us. We tried as best as we could to stay vigilant. Whatever was out there still posed an immediate threat. We walked cautiously, every creak and rustle adding to our unease. It was then that we found a small wooden sign on one of the trees. The words, Beware Wendigo Territory, sent chills down our spines. The pieces began to fit together, the horrible noises, the tracks with no trace, the grotesque mutilation of our teammate, all pointed towards one conclusion. Looking around at my frightened teammates and newfound allies, I knew that escaping that nightmarish forest had been a grave warning from a dark force beyond imagining. We had unknowingly ventured into the hunting grounds of an ancient Wendigo. It was a sight I had never seen before, the kind that would make anyone's heart skip a beat in terror. The crisp autumn skies painted with hues of orange and red signaled the start of my much-awaited solo camping trip. I had chosen Bar Harbor in Maine as my destination, partly due to the beautiful foliage that graced the landscape and partly because of its relative obscurity. A few weeks prior, I had purchased an RV for this very occasion, a big purchase but one I hoped would allow me to explore the world outside my monotonous office job. After quitting my position at Dean and Whitaker LLP, I couldn't wait to leave all the mundane trappings behind. I had been warned by some locals that September was known for unusual happenings. Even a couple of campers had disappeared without a trace. But I was never one for superstitions, so I shrugged it off as nothing more than folklore churned out by bored small-town folk. The trip started out fantastically well. Roaming the lush forests, hiking the rocky hills, and taking in breathtaking ocean views, pure bliss. From time to time, weird eerie sounds leaked from between dense trees but I brushed it off as wild animals or overactive imagination. One evening, while grilling freshly caught fish over an open fire, I decided to take a quick walk around the campsite before retiring for the night. Wandering into the woods under fading sunlight, I stumbled upon Caleb Durnham, another RV camper who'd parked his vehicle not too far from mine. Additionally alarming was that he appeared somewhat disoriented and dazed. As we exchanged pleasantries, he voiced his bewilderment about finding himself miles away from where he'd been just moments ago. Pondering over his predicament, we wondered if perhaps we were lost, but after confirming our coordinate readings on our phones, all doubts dissipated. Amidst the confusion, we shared our travel experiences and eventually retired to our respective RVs. Later that night, tapping noises on my RV's window roused me from a deep slumber. I blinked sleep from my eyes and peered outside the glass, and what I saw is something I can never unsee. A man with razor-thin gray hair, wild, unblinking eyes, elongated fingernails, and a sickly grin was pressed against the window, staring right back at me. The sheer terror that radiated through my veins made me immobile for a few moments. When my senses returned, I quickly slammed up against the door lock, trying everything to keep that grotesque apparition out of my RV. My desperate attempt to call 911 met an untimely end due to weak reception. 
As my brain raced to find a rational explanation for this horrifying encounter, it dawned on me that the antagonist did not exhibit even a hint of emotion or intent, just tapping his nails listlessly on the glass. The steady, rhythmic taps started to take their toll on me until, at some point, they suddenly ceased. Was he gone? Cautiously peering through the window curtains again, I spotted Caleb emerging from his RV armed with an axe in hand. He'd also heard the taps and quickly caught sight of our unwelcome visitor lurking in the darkness. Caleb, axe in hand, approached the eerie man cautiously but determinately. As he drew near, the man turned and attacked him, mercilessly slashing at Caleb with his grotesque fingernails. Blood spattered onto the ground around them as Caleb fought to defend himself, struggling to hold on to the axe. I watched in horror, unable to move or even call out for help. The sickening sound of flesh ripping echoed through the night air while I felt consumed by fear and helplessness. At last, fueled by a surge of adrenaline, I burst from my RV and sprinted towards the campground's main office. The office seemed like a mile away as I ran through the darkness, my mind racing with fear for Caleb's life. What was that, man? Was he even human? Reaching the office, I pounded on the door desperately, begging whoever was inside to let me in. A nervous park ranger opened the door, startled by my frantic appearance. I breathlessly explained the situation as best I could while urging him to call for help immediately. Before long, we heard distant sirens approaching. Relief washed over me. Hope that Caleb might still be alive began to grow within me. A few moments later, police officers arrived, with paramedics following close behind. I led them to where Caleb had faced off against the terrifying attacker. As we reached the scene of the bloody struggle, we found no trace of the man with cold eyes and razor-like nails. Only Caleb lay there, battered and barely breathing, his life hanging by a thread. Paramedics rushed to his aid while police asked me some questions about what had happened, but my account seemed insufficient for an explanation of what we'd seen. While Caleb was taken away on a stretcher and loaded into an ambulance, several officers remained behind to search for clues or leads about our tormentor. Scouring every inch of our camping area but finding nothing, it seemed we had no way of holding our attacker responsible. Days later, I learned that Caleb had somehow survived the ordeal despite sustaining severe injuries. Our friendship was cemented by these disturbing events, and we stayed in contact after we left the campground. As it turned out, our attacker had escaped without a trace, leaving only the painful memories of his assault and a nagging question that haunted our thoughts. Who, or what, was this malicious entity? Old stories from the area spoke of a hermit living deep in those woods for decades. Eyewitness accounts described him as a soulless creature with unimaginable strength and animalistic instincts. Possibly driven mad by isolation or worse, this man now preyed on unsuspecting campers and travelers, ensuring that no one who encountered him would ever sleep soundly again. Though the police and other authorities never corroborated these claims, Caleb and I knew what we had witnessed was not the result of fever dreams or an overactive imagination. We decided to leave the investigation to others while focusing on our recovery and moving forward with our lives. Our friend Marco, who loved investigating paranormal events and legends, became intrigued by our account of the horrific encounter. Determined to uncover more about this elusive menace, he ventured into the woods and continued searching for answers long after Caleb and I had given up hope. Months later, when Marco finally returned from his investigation, he confided in us that he'd found enough evidence pointing towards an even more chilling conclusion than that of a hermit gone mad. 
He claimed to have discovered an identical series of gruesome attacks dating back more than two centuries, all originating from those very same woods near RV site number 39. Shocked at this revelation, we gasped in disbelief as the grim truth behind our horrifying encounter slowly dawned on us. The monstrous assailant who terrorized us that night was not merely a human criminal, but may have been an ageless supernatural force that had walked among us since time immemorial. Now, years later, Caleb and I have rebuilt our lives knowing that something sinister wanders the woods near that remote campground forever leaving us haunted by the grim mystery of RV Site Number 39. A shotgun blast rattled my eardrums as I sprinted for cover, my heart pounding like a jackhammer. I was on a reconnaissance mission in the dense forests of Michigan with my fellow Marine comrades. I had never seen or experienced anything like this before, and I knew my life would never be the same. Darius! shouted my teammate Anthony. Get your butt over here! I slid into cover behind a large oak tree and caught my breath. The rest of our team was huddled together, their faces a mix of panic and determination. Our commander, Major Stevens, assessed the situation through narrowed eyes. What in God's name is happening? I asked, trying to muster a weak smile. You got me, replied Alice, our communications specialist. All we know is that it's been picking us off one by one. What do you mean it? I insisted, now more confused than ever. Major Stevens turned to me his eyes serious and full of concern. Son, so far, all we've found are pieces of our squad. My stomach churned at the thought. Images of torn limbs and mangled bodies filled my mind. This was anything but funny. What can do that kind of damage? Jake asked nervously. My first thought was a bear. Major Stevens replied soberly. But at this point, nothing in these woods should be capable of what we're dealing with. For the next few hours, we cautiously made our way deeper into the forest while maintaining radio contact with base camp. Shadows danced around us as the sun began to set. Darius, Anthony whispered to me. You hear about the guy who survived a bear attack by playing dead? Yeah? I responded uncertainly. Well, he still gets invited to parties, Anthony smirked. That's because, aside from bears, he knows how to play dead drunk too. As much as I wanted to laugh, the growing tension erased any attempts. The eerie silence was broken by Alice's gasp. She pointed to a mangled, bloodied military-issue jacket hanging from a nearby tree branch. It bore the name Martinez, one of our missing team members. We stared at the gory evidence in silence. If this was supposed to be a joke, it isn't funny, Alice said through clenched teeth, her eyes glistening with rage. Major Stevens took charge. We need to keep moving, and for the love of whatever sanity is left in us, stay frosty. As dusk fell, we stumbled upon something terrifying. Impaled on branches, as if they were speared by an unseen force, were the remains of our compatriots. The sight was too much for me to handle. Bile rose into my throat, and I turned to vomit under a tree. What could do something like that? Jake exclaimed. It sure as hell isn't a bear. Major Stevens shook his head in disbelief and said with conviction, Whatever it is out there, it's got us in its sights. We continued, armed to the teeth and ready for battle. The subtle rustling of leaves made us jumpy and paranoid. Every little sound instilled fear in us. But nothing could have prepared me for what I saw next. It had ascended from the darkness between the trees, 
tall with menacing red eyes that glowed unnervingly in the night. The creature, which manifested like some twisted fusion of man and beast, was covered in thick black fur that seemed to absorb surrounding light. Its elongated arms and legs bent at unnatural angles were equipped with razor-sharp claws capable of shredding anything unfortunate enough to cross its path. Its powerful jaw housed rows of serrated teeth, dripping droplets of blood from its prior victims. It lunged towards us with lightning-quick speed, swiping at Jake, who barely dodged in time. We opened fire, but the bullets seemed to have little effect. The beast snarled and retreated into the shadows once more, leaving us confused and terrified. How do we even kill this thing? I shouted in desperation. If we knew that, Alice stuttered. I don't think any of this would be happening right now. Knowing that we couldn't fight the beast head on, we had to come up with a plan. We still had our communication devices, but with no knowledge of what this creature was, who could help us. We didn't even know what to call it. Listen, Major Stevens said, addressing the group. We need to get out of this forest alive. Our best bet is to send a distress signal to headquarters and hope they can send reinforcements. We nodded in agreement. Even though we couldn't fight the creature directly, we still needed someone who could. Desperate times call for desperate measures. As Alice sent the signal, we continued to move through the forest. The chilling howls and rustling of leaves followed us wherever we went. We were being hunted. Just as the first glimmer of hope found us, when a voice on the other end responded to our distress call, the creature struck again. Snarling and roaring, it appeared from the shadows and looked even more terrifying than before. Its fur was matted with blood, and its eyes reflected pure hatred. Jake attempted to buy us some time by emptying another magazine into it, but again, the bullets seemed to make little difference. The creature grabbed him by the arm and flung him into a tree with a sickening crunch. Jake was alive but immobile, so we hauled him on our shoulders. As we moved as fast as possible given our circumstances, I listened in on Alice's conversation with headquarters. Situation report, multiple casualties, unidentified hostile life form, she said urgently. Yes, no, nothing like this, she replied moments later. Rendezvous coordinates confirmed. She looked at me with determination in her eyes. They're sending an extraction team to a designated location about six kilometers from here. They've directed us to avoid engagement at all costs. But the creature had other plans. As we reached a clearing, it ambushed us once more. I had never been so horrified in all my life. Its predatory instincts were undeniable. Major Stevens shouted, Split up! We can regroup once we've lost it. Our group dispersed in different directions. I tried to keep Jake with me, but his weight became too much, and I knew I had to leave him behind. Before I left him, I made a makeshift splint for his leg and instructed him to hide and wait for my return. With every step, the creature's heavy breathing grew closer. Adrenaline surged through my veins as the instinct for self-preservation took hold. Stumbling upon a steep cliffside, I realized there was nowhere left to run. The creature followed closely behind. But just as it prepared to leap toward me, a helicopter emerged over the tree line, a bright spotlight fixed on the monstrous beast. Freeze! A voice echoed from the chopper. It was clear they intended to subdue the monster rather than kill it. The creature looked up at the helicopter, then back at me, silently calculating whether it should continue its pursuit or retreat. In that moment, Two heavily armed soldiers were lowered from ropes to confront the beast. Even against adversaries of this caliber, though, 
The creature fought with incredible strength and agility. As reinforcements converged on my location and engaged in a fierce battle with the beast, I went back for Jake. Despite grave injuries of his own accord and a face marred by pain, he was alive, incredibly relieved to see me. A soldier found us and helped carry Jake back toward the extraction point while others continued their struggle against the unstoppable beast. It was unclear what techniques they were using or how they seemed better equipped for this fight, but they managed to subdue it enough for all of us to escape. Reaching the helicopter in the clearing we had originally dispersed from, we found Alice and Major Stevens already aboard. As we boarded the aircraft, the last thing I saw was the incapacitated creature lying on the ground, its red eyes burning with fury, before it was encased in a containment vessel. I knew two things at that moment. First, we had survived, though some at great cost. Second, I would never be able to forget those red eyes staring at me, or the friends we had lost in that horrifying confrontation. I was headed back to my apartment after a long day at the courier office, feeling exhausted from the endless stream of packages and letters that needed delivering. I chuckled to myself, thinking about how one of my co-workers had accidentally misplaced a package containing a priceless antique face during the chaos of the day. Oh, how I'd love to see the owner's face when they received their precious delivery. As I made my way, I noticed something strange about the streets of downtown Bridgeport, Connecticut. It was unusually quiet and desolate for an early evening in this usually buzzing city. But after such a hectic day at work, this unexpected serenity was a welcome change. As I turned onto a residential street lined with tall trees and old Victorian houses with their intricate woodwork, I saw an old man hunched over on his porch swing, clutching his chest painfully. Concerned for his well-being, I sprinted over to him with one hand, reaching for my phone to call an ambulance. Before I could dial 911, however, he managed to mumble something. His words were labored and choked by pain. Don't go near it. Something evil is lurking. His eyes were wide with terror as he motioned towards an old warehouse further down the street. Though skeptical of his claim about some vague evil presence, I couldn't shake off the sense of unease that washed over me. As the paramedics arrived and tended to him, curiosity took hold of me. I discreetly made my way down to the supposedly cursed warehouse. The massive rusty doors creaked as they opened under my forceful push. Inside was a dark labyrinth full of dusty crates and discarded machinery covered by layers of cobwebs, like the remnants of some long-forgotten civilization. The air was thick with dust particles that lazily drifted around as if disturbed by an unnatural presence. Cautiously navigating the dimly lit space, I heard a sound that sent shivers up my spine. Soft. Echoing footsteps grew louder and closer, making me question the sanity of continuing deeper into the warehouse. That was when I saw a faint silhouette lurking in the distant darkness, a large figure at least seven feet tall with oddly elongated limbs. Desperately trying to maintain my composure, I tried to strike up a conversation with it, or rather, with him. His voice was guttural and filled with an indescribable malice. He spoke of horrific acts he had committed in his long, twisted existence and recounted gruesome details of victims he had mercilessly tortured. As we conversed in hushed whispers, I suddenly realized that I didn't know this man's name or anything about him beyond these terrible confessions. My instinct screamed for me to escape before becoming yet another addition to his atrocious modus operandi. 
I attempted to leave through the storage room, but instead found myself in a spiraling maze-like chamber filled with mutilated and disfigured remains, artifacts of this man's sadistic obsessions. Oozing fluid stained the floor with sickening hues, and limbs were strewn about as if they were discarded toys. The creature's laughter echoed menacingly, and I could feel its presence drawing closer, a tense moment that seemed like it would stretch on forever as my life flashed before my eyes. The following day, while still shaken by the nightmarish encounter, I headed to the nearby town to find answers. I stopped in a dingy local bar for a drink and, hopefully, some conversation that would shed light on the psychopath I had met. As I nursed my drink, I overheard an older man at the other end of the bar mentioning a man named James Baxter. He referred to him as an unhinged monster who, he had heard, once even tortured his own family. This piqued my interest, so I cautiously approached and interjected myself into their conversation. Listening more intently now, I pieced together that James Baxter was a notorious serial killer and skinwalker who had made his home in these woods. People shared detailed accounts of the brutal atrocities he committed in town, but nothing seemed to connect him with the supernatural creature he had become. The locals spoke with certainty of the strange occurrences and sightings surrounding this man but they were hesitant to believe in the supernatural aspects of his story. As people began to notice just how uneasy this topic was making me, one burly guy asked why I was so interested. After hesitating for a moment, I recounted my harrowing experience in the storage room maze, and their expressions turned truly horrified. Fearing for my safety and perhaps their own, they urged me to go to the local authorities. When I arrived at the police station and explained what had happened, they shared more information on James Baxter, an escaped psychopath who they claimed could manipulate people's minds and distort reality, making them see things that weren't really there. The arresting officer went on, describing James' terrifying ability to confront his victims with their deepest fears horrific scenes similar to those in my confrontation with him. Upon further investigation by both local law enforcement and paranormal experts in our region, it was determined there were no definitive answers available as to whether this man truly was a skinwalker or merely an extraordinarily deranged serial killer. The only certainty was that both his physical and psychological presence carried immeasurable danger. For months after this encounter, I lived in a constant state of anxiety, always looking over my shoulder and avoiding the shadows at every turn. The disturbing memories from that twisted night continued to plague my mind, and I could feel the fear gnawing away at me. One evening, just as sleep began to claim me, I heard distant laughter echoing through my home. My eyes shot open and I was gripped with terror. It was unmistakably the voice of James Baxter. Lying in bed, paralyzed, I listened to his cackles grow closer, each step he took sending shivers down my spine. And then suddenly, deafening silence. The laughter ceased, and darkness enveloped me. That chilling night was never spoken of again in town and the horror of what I had experienced disappeared with James Baxter into thin air. Seemingly just like that, life began to move forward as the fear slowly subsided. Yet even now, far removed from my harrowing encounter with James Baxter in those woods years ago, there remains an unshakable feeling deep within me, not only that his presence still lingers somewhere out there, but that one day, when I least expect it, he could return in search of his last intended victim. I've always been a stickler for punctuality. My watch is my most valuable possession. 
It was given to me by my grandfather, who'd always say, Time waits for no one, not even a ranger. True to his words, I chose a career that demanded the utmost respect for time. My name is Harold Dempsey, and I'm a ranger at Kings Canyon National Park in California. I've been on the job for about five years, and it's been rewarding but uneventful for the most part. Never did I imagine that one day in March would turn my relatively mundane life upside down. It started with an unsettling discovery. One evening after the sun had vanished, leaving an eerie silence after a long day of patrolling, I was guiding a group of hikers back to their campsite when we stumbled upon a shredded piece of cloth and some broken branches. The hikers seemed spooked, unable to come up with any explanation apart from wild animals or delinquents playing tricks on unsuspecting hikers. After calming everyone down and making light of it with some friendly humor, we continued our way back to camp. I couldn't call for backup as radio signals were weak and unreliable once deep within the canyon. As days went by and that strange feeling refused to dissipate, a peculiar pattern emerged. Similar incidents started happening more frequently. Before long, park visitors were reporting sinister shadows darting in their peripheral vision. Some guests recounted hauntingly vivid nightmares of the canyon sprouting countless sharp branches, spearing them through mercilessly but without leaving any marks once they'd awakened in a cold sweat. My gut twisted as these occurrences piled up like consistent snowfall in the dead of winter until it came to head during an outbound camping trip with some regular visitors whom I'd grown fond of, a group of nature enthusiasts aging between 30 and 70 years old who explored different parks every weekend. That day, the crisp bear flirted with our expectations as we hiked along the park's winding trails laughter and excitement filled the air with contagious vitality. I couldn't shake off that gnawing restlessness, but my desire to keep our spirits high prompted me to share my wilderness knowledge, peppered with some dad jokes. Little did I know that would be a fragile shelter against the storm brewing over us. Treachery began when that elusive foe emerged from the shadows mid-evening, striking the campsite mercilessly as we gathered around the fire. A deafening crack resonated, sending chills to our bones as a fallen tree branch narrowly missed Emily, our group's youngest member. I had never seen any creature like it, though I could hardly describe the monstrous figure blended in the darkness an embodiment of dread with eyes that glinted like sapphires cutting through a starless sky. Fear struck us faster than lightning, but any attempt to flee was useless without navigation tools or a sense of direction. We huddled together in the circle of flickering light, knowing we were its prey, caged within uncertainty. It charged towards Emily again, but this time Lenny, a seasoned camper and retired soldier in his seventies, dashed forward, armed with nothing but his weathered camera tripod, and met this monstrosity head-on. The ground shook as he landed a blow on it. Their struggle resembled a dance choreographed by mayhem. Each side advanced and retreated frantically with bruising precision. I could no longer rely on my trusty watch. Countering every attack on my friends defined my reality now as we all battled back as best we could against this living nightmare, which only grew hungrier for our demise. And now, just waiting for another opportunity to strike, teeth bared and muscles tense like stone, this beast stared us down from where it hid among soil and shadows. I steeled myself as its snarl rang fiercely through the canyon damning my watch as time trembled against its inescapable onslaught. The battle continued, with Emily, Lenny, and I using whatever makeshift weapons we could find. The creature attacked ferociously and relentlessly in its pursuit to end us. 
my friends and I acted out of pure survival instinct, desperately defending ourselves against the horrifying beast. As claws raked through the air and teeth snapped inches from our faces, we couldn't afford to call for help or even think about why this horror was happening. All that mattered was staying alive. Despite our best efforts in the chaotic struggle, our tiny group began to falter. The creature wounded Lenny severely with a swipe of its massive claws, and he fell to the ground in a pool of blood. Emily screamed in terror but continued her futile battle, wielding a sharp rock she had found minutes ago. As I scanned the area for more tools to aid in our fight, my eyes caught the glint of something metallic half buried in nearby dirt. It was an old flare gun with a single cartridge still inside. Grabbing it and hoping it would work, I aimed at the creature as it lunged towards Emily. With a deafening bang, the flare flew towards the beast and collided with its massive form. The creature roared in agony as flames spread across its body, causing it to momentarily recoil from its assault on my friend. Seizing this opportune moment, we scrambled away from the inferno that engulfed our former attacker. Despite her injuries from battling the nightmare that tormented us all night, Emily managed to help Lenny up before hobbling away from the forest clearing. The three of us eventually staggered to a nearby road where, exhausted and battered from our ordeal, we were picked up by an ambulance called by passing motorists who saw us limping along with bloodied clothes and faces. After receiving medical attention and having explained what happened to skeptical authorities who blamed mass hysteria or some kind of wild animal attack, we were sent home to recover both physically and mentally. The best way we could make sense of the nightmarish encounter was to label it as some sadistic creature hunting unsuspecting campers for its cruel sport. Emily, Lenny, and I tried our best to move on from the tragedy but found it difficult to forget the grisly events. We made a pact never to return or even discuss that terrible night, for fear that revisiting the memory would somehow call this beast back into our lives. But in all honesty, I couldn't let go. Months later, my curiosity still lingered about the terrifying being that had nearly claimed our lives. It haunted my thoughts, appearing in my dreams now and then as an amalgamation of spectral snarls and bloody screams. Finally succumbing to temptation, I began researching local legends and stories about similar encounters, looking for any trace of a possible explanation for our nightmarish experience. My search led me on a winding path through books and forums discussing various cryptozoological mysteries and regional occurrences of horrific sightings. After painstakingly sifting through countless legends at the cost of countless sleepless nights, one story eventually stood out from the rest, too eerily similar to ignore. A tale describing a monstrous creature that stalked through forests during dusk and preyed upon unwary travelers like some cruel predator playing with its food. My eyes widened as I read further and finally discovered what we had encountered on that fateful night, the dreaded Kropajak. The creature's name sent shivers down my spine but simultaneously brought me an odd sense of closure. With this revelation came a solemn vow, Emily, Lenny, and I would always remain vigilant in ensuring that no one else endured the horror we faced. No one deserved what we went through at the claws and fangs of this heinous abomination lurking in the shadows. As soon as I stepped into Rocky Mountain National Park, something felt off. Sure, I'd faced more than my fair share of peculiar situations during my tenure as a park ranger, but this was different. It seemed like an ordinary day in the park, yet an ominous feeling gnawed at me. 
Nature was in full swing. Birds were chirping and squirrels darted through the underbrush. But every so often, there was just this eerie silence that hung heavily in the air. I put these thoughts aside and focused on my daily duties. My patrol route led me along the park's many winding trails, providing ample opportunity to spot wildlife and inspect the state of park facilities. Around noon, I met another fellow ranger named Jasper Parrish, whom I had known for years, and we decided to take a break and discuss any updates or issues we'd encountered. Everything seems normal, Jasper said, chewing on his sandwich. But I've got this weird gut feeling that something's off today. Yeah, me too, I admitted. I just can't shake it. We spent a few minutes discussing our intuition, or maybe just paranoia, but ultimately dismissed it as nothing more than overactive imaginations. The rest of my shift went smoothly until I approached a clearing where backpackers often stayed for the night. There, lying crumpled on the ground, was a woman. Her terrified eyes connected with mine as she whimpered in pain her entire body covered in deep gashes and blood seeping through her torn clothing. Help me, she croaked. Felicity? Jasper recognized her as one of our park's regular visitors. We immediately radioed for help, but being in such a remote part of the park presented several challenges for reaching medical assistance quickly enough. Felicity clung to consciousness as she muttered about something that attacked her while she was hiking. We tried to probe for more information, but every word she spoke seemed to drain her strength. As we sat waiting helplessly for backup to arrive, the air grew cold and our surroundings went quiet once again. Suddenly, an otherworldly howl filled the silence sending shivers down both my and Jasper's spines. Felicity's eyes widened in terror. Without a second thought, Jasper withdrew his firearm while I grabbed my knife, scanning our surroundings for any signs of danger. Fear gripped me tightly as we tried to come up with an impromptu defense plan. There's no help close by. It's just the two of us, Jasper whispered. We need to make sure whatever that creature is doesn't return. As we stood in the clearing, our breaths coming in ragged gasps, we heard rustling in the underbrush around us. The foliage shook with increasing intensity as an unspeakably grotesque creature revealed itself before us. Its twisted form was unlike anything either of us had ever seen. A massive hulking beast swathed in darkness that seemed to writhe and pulse with the blackest shadow imaginable. The creature's mouth opened to expose rows upon rows of razor-sharp teeth covered in fresh blood. The creature began closing the distance between us, its movements unnaturally swift and fluid. Back away slowly, I whispered to Jasper, careful not to make any sudden movements. We need to get Felicity and ourselves out of here. As we inched away, my eyes remained fixed on the beast, but my mind raced with thoughts on how to ensure our escape. Jasper was skilled both as a ranger and in combat, but it was clear that our opponent was unlike anything we had ever faced before. Simultaneously, we both realized that radioing for help should be our next move. We couldn't defeat this creature on our own nor protect Felicity from its wrath. As Jasper attempted to contact backup, his voice cracking with nerves, the beast emitted another gut-wrenching howl. Horror filled me as more rustling from the nearby bushes indicated that this monster wasn't alone. Several smaller creatures joined it, each displaying similar grotesque features but with slight differences in size and appearance. They moved in perfect harmony, always keeping an eye on their target, us. Our radios crackled without response from the other end. With no help coming and time running out, 
we knew we needed an alternative plan. The prospect of defending ourselves seemed slim until I remembered a nearby abandoned ranger station stocked with supplies. Jasper, there's a station not too far from here, I said urgently. We can barricade ourselves inside until help arrives. With no better options available and darkness falling around us, we agreed to this strategy despite its uncertainty. Carrying Felicity between us while armed with our limited weapons, we embarked on the perilous trek through the park. Horrifying sounds followed us as the vile creatures stalked our every step. Their blood-chilling screams echoed like a twisted chorus through the otherwise silent forest. Each moment brought terror closer to overtaking reason, fear for my life, fear for Jasper's life, and fear for poor Felicity, who had already endured so much. The ranger station came into view as nightfall settled in, offering a glimmer of hope amidst the chaos. We quickly entered the building and breathed a sigh of relief when we discovered that the supplies were still there. Moments later, we barricaded the doors and windows as best we could, preparing ourselves for the approaching nightmare. Throughout the night, the creatures tested our defenses relentlessly. The sound of their claws scratching at the walls was unbearable. It seemed as if they were driven by some insatiable hunger specifically focused on us. Eventually, radio contact was regained, and we managed to call for help once more. The hours dragged on, but finally help arrived in the form of an experienced search and rescue team. As they helped us safely exit the station and led us away from our gruesome ordeal, one of them muttered something under his breath that sent chills down my spine. Blackwood serpents, he said, clearly knowing what had hunted us in those dark hours. Just one day prior, I'd never even heard of such creatures existing, but now their name would forever be etched in my memory as a reminder of the terror from which we barely escaped alive. I pulled into the small truck stop just outside of Eureka, Nevada feeling the need to stretch my legs and grab a cup of coffee. My name's Dalton Hudspeth, and I'm a truck driver delivering all sorts of goods across this vast country. As I climbed out of my rig, a sense of unease washed over me for no apparent reason. This place seemed ordinary enough, but something about it struck me as off. Ignoring the uneasy feeling, I made my way inside the dingy diner adjacent to the gas station. Behind the counter was a middle-aged woman with frazzled hair who seemed preoccupied with her crossword puzzle. Ordering my coffee black and hot, she poured it into a slightly stained mug before returning her attention to her game. After exchanging pleasantries and an attempt at humor on my part, I heard a commotion coming from outside. A man in red overalls was chasing after his dog, which had escaped from his pickup truck. Leave it to me to find comedy in the strangest places. I thought as I sipped on my scalding coffee, noting how life won't cease to surprise us. Slowly starting to relax back into my usual light-hearted demeanor, there came an abrupt interruption from the faint sound of someone screaming just beyond the parking lot. All movement inside the diner suddenly stopped as we listened intently. Feeling a sense of responsibility, given that the commotion was nearby, I stepped out and walked toward where I thought the scream originated from. The sound seemed muffled, as if coming from below the ground or behind thick walls. Having reached a row of storage units behind the truck stop area, I tried various doors but didn't have any luck finding their source. Growing more anxious as seconds ticked by, I finally heard another desperate scream piercing through one particular unit's door. 
out of options and consumed by fear for whoever might be in need, I decided to kick down the door. It gave way after a few sturdy boots. As the dim sunlight seeped in, the grotesque scene that unfolded was one I would never forget. A tall man dressed in a dark hood and torn clothes stood over another individual chained to a wall. The bloodied victim had clearly been brutalized and now seemed to be choking on their own blood. The hooded man's hands were covered in gore, and different tools of torture were scattered around him. Seeing me, the man tilted his head and grinned from ear to ear, revealing a horrific set of rotting teeth and an unbridled madness within his eyes. My body went numb, unable to comprehend the morbid scenario taking place before me. I steeled myself for whatever might come next, but I knew that I could not face this monster alone. Desperately trying to signal the woman back at the diner for help without making any sudden moves, I attempted some pathetic lip gestures through the tiny, crack-open door as my eyes bore into her with urgency. Sadly, she did not grasp at my silent pleas or acknowledge my frightened gaze whatsoever. The feeling of being alone and vulnerable was overwhelming. Mustering all my courage, I glanced back towards the hooded man, only to see that he had disappeared and left his torture chamber momentarily unattended. Without further hesitation or thought, I sprinted across the truck stop, hoping against hope that I might somehow escape this nightmare unscathed. Focused on putting as much distance between myself and that horrifying scene as possible, I didn't notice my surroundings shifting around me. A dense fog rolled in from nowhere, silent save for its eerie whispers that threatened to drive me mad with fear. The dense fog disoriented me, but somehow I made my way back to the truck stop. With haste, I told the woman at the diner about what I had just witnessed, explaining that it was crucial that we call for help immediately. You mean, like the police? She stammered nervously. Yes, I affirmed. But we need to make sure they get here quickly. There's a man and torturing people in those storage units. Seeing her worried expression and hesitance to take any quick action, I assumed control and dialed 911. Unfortunately, the fog had taken a toll on cell service, and I wasn't getting through. In a desperate attempt to save the victim, I pleaded with the lady at the diner to contact the local mechanic, who might have some bolt cutters or anything that could potentially free them. She hesitated but agreed after seeing my panic-stricken face. The visitor in red overalls from earlier overheard the commotion and offered to help as well. Together, we ventured back to that dread-filled storage unit armed only with bolt cutters and a crowbar provided by the mechanic. I approached cautiously, fearing any sudden movements would provoke further harm to the victim. As we carefully opened the door, my blood turned cold at what lay before us. The storage unit was completely empty, no torture tools, no chained individual, and no hooded man in sight. What's going on? asked the man in red overalls nervously. I don't understand, I murmured in astonishment. I swear they were here just moments ago. The woman from the diner shook her head skeptically, likely questioning my sanity, or if this was some sort of cruel hoax. Regardless of how it appeared, I knew what I had seen was real. My search for answers led me to make inquiries around town and discover that two locals, Marcia and Jim Merrick, had vanished in the last couple of months. The townspeople held a private meeting to discuss these disappearances and shared with me the name of Lenny Morton, a man recently released from prison whose actions matched those I had faced. The details were eerily similar dark hoods, brutal murders, and merciless torture. I knew in my gut that Lenny was responsible, 
but we had no concrete evidence against him. Over the following days, I couldn't shake the haunting image of the bloodied victim from my mind. The gruesome brutality of it all settled in my thoughts, constantly reminding me of how easily our lives could be morphed into morbid canvases at the hands of a maniac like Lenny. Feeling incapable of leaving matters unresolved, I decided to act before any more innocent lives were taken. I made several attempts to contact law enforcement in neighboring towns but fell short due to them being stretched thin on other cases and insufficient evidence pointing to Lenny. I knew taking down someone as dangerous as Lenny Morton required a well-thought-out plan. As day turned into night, I carefully plotted my next move, hoping that somehow my actions would lead to his undoing. As I lay in bed that evening with every intention to confront Lenny Morgan personally the following day, sleep eluded me. The thought of what might happen next was like a specter lurking just beyond sight, an eerie presence either seen nor understood fully but managing to claw its tendrils deep into every fiber of my being. Little did I know just how near danger truly was, unbeknownst to me or anyone else in Eureka. Lenny Morton's next vicious act would soon be unleashed upon us all, and the town would never be quite the same again. I was in the middle of rolling up another marshmallow-filled esmore when the sound of shattering glass pierced the evening calm like a needle. I dropped the concoction and grabbed a flashlight, rushing out of the RV to investigate. Timothy! What's going on? My friend Rosalind inquired, emerging from her tent. I don't know, I replied, eyeing the broken beer bottle by a nearby tree. But this wasn't here five minutes ago. We were camping in an isolated area within Yellowstone National Park. It was supposed to be a tranquil escape from our daily routines. Instead, it had taken an unexpected turn towards danger. April and Peter went on that hike hours ago. They should have been back by now, Rosalind said nervously, browsing her phone despite having no signal. Did you hear that? Peter's voice stammered suddenly from behind her as he stumbled into view, visibly shaken. Guys, we need to leave now. What's going on? I asked, helping my exhausted friend regain his composure. April emerged from the darkness too, her face pale and her eyes wide open with terror. We saw there was someone. He had blood on his hands. He... Their words felt like an ice-cold stab to my heart. This hadn't been some overenthusiastic camper with a beer bottle. There was something far more menacing lurking around us. We piled into the RV, panicked breaths filling the small space as we barricaded the door shut with anything we could find. Suitcases, chairs. It wasn't long before we heard someone, or something, banging against the door repeatedly, sending thunderous vibrations through our makeshift barricade. As adrenaline surged through my veins, I peered cautiously through a gap in the curtains. He was an ordinary-looking man in his late thirties, dressed in tattered clothes with broken glass embedded in the soles of his shoes. His face was a mask of malicious intent, and his eyes were filled with hatred and cruelty as he tried to wrench open the door. Suddenly, he stopped and turned his attention towards the thick forest canopy. Without warning, he picked up an axe from among the clutter of camping tools and started charging towards the trees as though mindlessly driven by an unseen force. April squeaked out, I told you I saw him back there. What's his deal? I pulled her back from the window. We need to formulate a plan before he comes back. Let's break our phones for sharp pieces and take any blunt objects just in case we need to defend ourselves. Just then, 
the RV began to shake violently, as though it were being struck by a giant. The sounds of breaking dishes and chipping would echo through its walls, surrounding us with a cacophony of chaos. What if it's him? Peter mumbled under his breath as we scrambled for makeshift weapons. This guy could be some sort of uncaught serial killer. We might be next. Peter's words hung heavily in the air, suffocating our hope like a noose. Rosalind clasped her hands around her pocket knife and muttered bitterly, If we die tonight, we're going down fighting. The pounding persisted relentlessly on the RV walls, sending fracture lines spider webbing across the windows until there was only one choice left before us flee or stay cornered like sitting ducks. We formulated a plan. Peter would launch himself at our attacker using his belt as some form of whip to temporarily blind them, while April made her way around behind him, wielding a burning hot frying pan from over the fire pit. I would hold on to my can of bug spray that I'd found lying beneath my seat in case another opportunity arose, while Rosalind kept vigilant with her pocket knife. As we gathered our makeshift weapons and assessed the situation, it became clear that calling for help was not an option. Our phones had no signal in this remote location, and the nearest town was miles away. We knew we had to rely on ourselves and stick together if we were to survive the night. Peter readied his belt while April clutched the scalding frying pan, their faces a mix of determination and fear. Rosalind wielded her pocket knife, and I grasped the can of bug spray tightly. We took strategic positions near the RV door, waiting for our attacker to return. The moments stretched on, and the anticipation heightened with every passing second. When he reappeared at last, he seemed even more menacing than before, and his face contorted with rage as he wielded his axe. His sweaty brow was furrowed, and strands of greasy hair stuck to his forehead as he approached our fragile haven. Without further delay, Peter sprang into action, lashing out with his belt aimed at the attacker's face. Simultaneously, April maneuvered herself behind him and swung her frying pan with all her might against his skull. The man stumbled but did not fall. The axe in his hand sliced through the air, narrowly missing Peter's arm as he backed away in terror, our make-believe weapons doing little to subdue him. Rosalind rushed forward then, pocket knife in hand, aiming for any exposed flesh she could find. To her dismay, the man caught her wrist before she could reach him. With Herculean force, he flung her aside like a rag doll onto the ground. She lay there motionless, blood pooling beneath her head. This enraged me beyond belief. I couldn't comprehend what kind of person could brutalize another human being, let alone four strangers camping in the woods. Gathering all my courage and rage, I lunged at our attacker. The bug spray could point directly toward his face like a makeshift flamethrower. The liquid chemical shot out in a harsh stream and hit him square in the eyes, creating temporary blindness. Howling in pain, he dropped the axe and staggered backward. We seized our chance and ran as fast as we could through the dark forest. We did not stop to think or catch our breath. We had just one goal, to get as far away from him as possible. Hours later, we stumbled upon a dirt road, exhausted and battered but alive. When a truck driver picked us up and drove us to the nearest town, we explained what had transpired in shaky voices. A police squad was immediately dispatched to search for the man who had terrorized us, and we discovered countless other campers before us. Through meticulous investigation and media attention garnered by our harrowing story, they finally caught the madman, a former logger by the name of Gregory Bloody Axe Wilson. They discovered that he had been living off-grid in those woods for years, following a grisly series of murders that took the lives of several co-workers at his logging company. 
For reasons unknown yet speculated by psychologists, Gregory became consumed by bloodlust. He stalked and terrorized campers visiting the area while evading capture for all those years, until that fateful night when we encountered him amidst our own quiet getaway. Despite our losses, for Rosalind did not survive her injuries, we were thankful to escape with our lives and bring an end to a reign of terror that had haunted those woods for years. Though shaken by memories of that gruesome encounter, we gradually moved on with renewed gratitude for life's fragility, and an unbreakable bond formed in survival against all odds. The Creeping Shape, from Jason Brighton 15. I absolutely despise car trouble. This happened to me on the 5th of November, 2003. I had been out of town for a conference when my old car gave up the ghost. I guess that's what I get for relying on a jalopy. A 25-mile hike brought me to the nearest small town, Pleasant Oaks. As I entered John's Auto Services, a fellow customer waiting in the small lounge greeted me with a crooked smile and an afternoon. Her name was Nancy Daniels, she told me. Nancy had a distinct southern drawl and owned one of the local diners in town. After a brief examination of my tired, broken car, John informed me it would take at least three days to fix it. I sighed heavily and headed to Nancy's diner for some much-needed comfort food. That evening, I found myself chatting with Nancy and some regulars in her diner about their day-to-day -day lives. They told me strange stories about unusual incidents around town, livestock found ripped apart, gruesome vandalism at their community center, and homes broken into every few weeks that left people distraught. I chuckled nervously but didn't think much of it until later that night as I walked back to the little motel nearby where I was staying. The streets were quiet, with only a dim street light illuminating the stretch from a distance. Out of nowhere, a chilling scream echoed through the night air. With my heart pounding in my chest, I ran towards the source and found Nancy's younger cousin Ben huddled by his damaged car. He was shivering violently and badly shaken when he described his attacker as a huge, faceless man, with powerful arms who disappeared almost instantly after cornering him. We made our way back to my motel room, where we both tried, unsuccessfully, to sleep as paranoia crept into our thoughts. Although my skepticism was still intact, the unsettling air of the evening seemed to disagree. The next day, I found myself with some locals who shared their own chilling stories. Each account featured the same faceless figure making threats and spreading terror anywhere it went. It seemed as if the whole town was on edge. By nightfall, I became acutely aware that this faceless entity might not be a figment of people's imaginations. A heavy sense of dread settled over me as I locked my motel door and attempted to sleep, but sleep wouldn't come. Around midnight, I heard the distant sound of shattering glass, followed by screams and chaos coming from down the street. Fueled by fear and a foolish sense of bravery, I grabbed my pocket knife, which now felt more like a flimsy toothpick than a weapon, and went out to see what was going on. Several people had gathered near Tom's Market, which now had its front window smashed in from the brazen attack by the faceless nightmare. Tom's neighbor recounted how she saw, just moments ago, that horrifying figure hurling bricks through the glass before tearing an unfortunate passerby apart. As she described her experience in great detail, with everyone listening with horrifying awe and trepidation, we noticed that a gruff and tough-looking man named Luke suddenly took off like a bolt of lightning towards his humble residence located near the edge of town. 
He insisted that he needed to secure his family and home before something happened to them. We watched him disappear into the night, knowing we wouldn't just stand idly by while one of our own faced danger alone. Thus began our tense journey through deserted streets towards Luke's house. The inky black sky seemed to breathe terror into our very souls. Reaching Luke's residence felt like years had passed before we finally encountered him just outside his front door, wielding a shotgun anxiously. He beckoned us closer, shushing us to keep quiet. As we gathered beside him, we noticed the faintest sound of shallow breaths from within his home. We cautiously entered Luke's home and were greeted by the sight of his terrified wife, Sarah, clutching their toddler. We tried to calm her down and gathered in a huddle, discussing our next move. Police intervention was discussed, but we realized they wouldn't believe us and would only bring unwanted attention to our community. It felt like a losing battle. Days later, as the faceless terror continued to plague our town, more people united to protect their loved ones and neighborhoods. Attempts were made to set up search parties and groups to patrol the streets, but every attempt ended in tragedy. This creature was relentless and seemed impossible to confront or escape. One day, a breakthrough came from Tom's neighbor, who had witnessed its attack on the market just a few nights ago. She noticed the faceless figure was always seen near the locations of attacks but was never present during them. She concluded that the entity must have had some control over its surroundings that allowed it to vanish momentarily during daylight hours. This revelation gave us hope that we could exploit its weakness and catch it off guard. We regrouped at Luke's house, creating a plan that entailed remaining indoors during daylight hours, with people traveling only in groups until sunset, when everyone would return home and lock themselves inside. As dusk approached, I listened to the faint whispers of everyone's goodbyes before returning to their families for another night of fear-induced insomnia. Although sleep would be elusive again due to heightened awareness and vigilance, there was a sense of unity among us against this faceless killer. Late one night after following this new routine, I began hearing thuds in the distance. It sounded like something making a hurried escape through backyards and alleyways. My heart hammered in my chest as I grabbed my flashlight and swung open my front door scanning the area while joining my fellow townspeople as they armed themselves with makeshift weapons. We knew we had cornered the faceless monster, and the primal act of survival unified everyone further. We tracked the direction of the thuds, eventually finding ourselves in a dead-end alleyway. The darkness seemed thicker here, but our adrenaline fueled us to press forward. As we inched closer, we could see a figure hunched over, breathing heavily. My flashlight illuminated the outline of features forming on its face, as if it were becoming less powerful due to our combined efforts. The faceless horror staggered up and looked at us with fear, a turn of events that we would have relished if not for the dread we still felt. The figure began backing away slowly, as if realizing that it couldn't win against an entire town united against it. As it retreated into the darkness of the alleyway and disappeared from view, we heard it murmur something incomprehensible. The whispers added more dread and mystery to its existence, only leaving us with questions and speculation about who or what it was or what their motives were. Recovered as a town from these harrowing events, People moved on with their lives while keeping their guard high, aware that such an evil had once haunted our streets. But these scars would always remind us that by facing adversity and terror together as a community, we became stronger. In hindsight, upon uncovering some old newspapers and connecting the dots of various accounts from survivors, it became apparent that our tormentor had once been part of a secret medical experiment gone awry, 
leaving its test subjects faceless and driven by an insatiable need to spread fear. Being a park ranger in northern Ontario has its perks. The crisp air, the tranquil forest, and the occasional encounter with extraordinary wildlife. My job had taken me to almost every part of Canada, including Dawson City, Yukon Territory. That's where it all started. I was at my usual post one morning when I got a radio call from one of my fellow rangers, Dave. He said something bizarre had happened during the night. An entire campsite had been destroyed as if it had been struck down with some colossal force. I followed him to the scene to see for myself. When I arrived, I couldn't believe my eyes. The tents, camping equipment, and various belongings were scattered all over the place, broken and mangled as though crushed under mammoth strength. But what was truly unsettling were the victims, shattered bones piercing through broken skin, blood-soaked clothes clinging to lifeless bodies. We've got to call for help, Dave said in a hushed tone. No service out here, I replied somberly, shaking my head. Never has been. We're on our own. We searched for clues but found nothing but an eerie silence that hung in the air like a thick fog, a strange quietness that felt almost unnatural at times. Days passed with no progress. Our anxiety mounted as we patrolled our territory with extreme caution. We'd gathered a few locals who'd pushed their curiosity to the test and ventured deeper into the woods in search of answers about what could have caused this catastrophe. Late one afternoon, we discovered something grotesque hanging from a tree, a mutilated deer carcass that seemed oddly deformed. It had far too many limbs and fangs protruding from its snout like some sort of twisted pig-dog hybrid creature. No known animal could have done this, a detail that chilled me to my core. We were dealing with something entirely unknown. I began sharing what had happened at work with my family back home during our infrequent calls. My mom always said I had a knack for storytelling, and that tickled their curiosity. But as laughter filled the phone line, I couldn't help but feel dread forming in the pit of my stomach. As I recounted the grim details about the victims, the macabre image of something sinister stalking the woods burned deep into my mind a terrible creature lurking just outside our field of vision, waiting to strike. The forest around us grew more threatening every day, a veritable soup of unease. But we were rangers. We knew these woods better than anyone, and we pressed on in our search for answers. Then, one gloomy night, Dave and I stumbled upon a trail during our routine patrol. The large, irregular footprints led towards an ominous cave with a haunting aura emitting from within. As we cautiously approached the mouth of the cave, a low growl echoed through its depths, an unearthly sound that boomed like a gunshot through my chest. Although apprehension clenched my gut, we pressed on, ever determined to solve this mystery and protect our park from whatever malevolence lingered in its midst. The cave's entrance was littered with discarded bones, proof that whatever dwelt within this chilling lair was responsible for the gruesome carnage at the campsite and beyond. Swallowing our fear, Dave and I ventured further into its voracious maw, armed only with bravery and flashlights to light our way. The growling intensified as we inched closer towards the heart of the cave. Each guttural resonance vibrated through us like thunderclouds, banishing any hope that this terror was simply an elaborate hoax. I will never forget what we saw next. My mind struggles to form words capable of encapsulating its horror, yet here I am recounting it now as best I can. It stood, a hulking, twisted mass of skin in terror, 
a grotesque chimera resembling a warped merging of animals beyond my most disturbed imagination, its eyes burning like fiery embers brandished by the very flames of hell. With the monstrous creature looming before us, Dave and I shared a quick glance, communicating without words that we had to act fast or risk meeting the same gruesome fate as those before us. Retreat! I whispered urgently, and we began inching backward, all while keeping our flashlights trained on the beast. Heart pounding in my chest, I knew calling for help was futile in this remote area, and we had to rely on our own wits to survive. Once safely outside the cave, we hastily regrouped with the other locals we had been working with, sharing our terrifying encounter with the grotesque chimera within. An old man among them gasped and began muttering about an ancient legend, one passed down through generations of his family, the tale of Wendigo. This Wendigo was a malevolent spirit believed to inhabit these northern forests a spirit that was said to take control of a person or an animal and create grotesque chimeras to do its bidding. The remote location, the gruesome attacks, and the beast's uncanny combination of various animals all aligned with the old man's story. With this newfound knowledge, terror gripped us even tighter. The Wendigo was not something that could be killed or contained, but perhaps there was a way to deter it from continuing its rampage. Equipped with incendiary devices crafted by our team for makeshift materials, we decided that if we couldn't destroy this malevolent being itself, we could at least destroy its lair, force it away from the park and back into the depths of the wilderness where it belonged. As night fell on day three after our encounter in the cave, fire lit up the sky as we backed away from the entrance. We couldn't guarantee that this would work, not when dealing with ancient legends, but it was our best shot at stopping this terror without any outside help. With heavy hearts, we watched the inferno consume the cave, hope and fear battling for control in our minds. Surely enough, silence fell upon our park again and life for its inhabitants seemed to return to normal. As forest rangers, we pledged to protect the lands within our jurisdiction and the lives they sustained. While we did not manage to get rid of the Wendigo completely, I hoped that our bold action that night would serve as a warning, that we would not back down in pursuit of peace amidst these wild expanses. Despite what some may call a victory, however, Dread gripped me each time I adventured near the now-scorched remains of the cave. Was it truly over? Or had we merely angered this ancient entity? That anxiety grew as I continued my work in other locations across Canada, sharing hushed whispers about my experience with other park rangers who shared their own fantastical tales. Years have passed since then but I still find myself glancing over my shoulder when venturing deep into the woods, unsure whether those snapped twigs are due to a passing deer or something more sinister. I feel that eerie tension every time I lay my head down in a tent at night, aware that evil is often but a thin canvas away. Even as I think of those who have experienced unthinkable horrors at the hands of beings like Wendigo, I know that knowledge of these entities must be kept alive, that they wait silently, hidden from sight by an ancient wisdom beyond comprehension. Often, remarking on these encounters leaves me feeling exposed and vulnerable to their wrathful agendas. But sharing my story also serves as a permanent reminder that danger is always present in this world's most remote locations and whether corporeal or spectral, life is fragile in the face of its eternal counterpart. I remember clearly the day it began. Perhaps it's carved so deeply into my mind because of its chilling magnitude. 
My name is Justin Crawford, and I was 19 when my life took a turn that forever left an indelible scar on my heart. It was the summer of 2011, July 9th, to be precise, when four of my best friends and I decided to go on a camping trip to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee. As Ken drove us down the winding road through the lush green landscape, we sang along to old tunes and cracked jokes that only made sense within our tight-knit group. The air around us was light-hearted and full of youthful excitement. Little did we know that our lives were about to change forever. Arriving at our campsite just before dark, we set up our tents and started a fire. Mason and Aaron took turns poking fun at each other while Tara and I cooked dinner over the open flame. When night fell, with curiosity overtaking us, we began exploring the forest, which glowed mysteriously in the moonlight. We stumbled upon an abandoned shack that sent chills coursing through our bodies. Unable to resist the lure of a thrilling adventure, we ventured inside against our better judgment. The floor creaked beneath us, each sound echoing through the pitch-black room. As we fumbled around, searching for anything interesting, Ken accidentally knocked over a rickety shelf filled with dusty jars and rotten contents. Suddenly, an overpowering stench flooded our nostrils. It was a vile mixture of decay and something unidentifiable. In our haste to leave that rank atmosphere behind, we failed to notice the dark figure watching us from a distance the start of our nightmare. From that moment on, an unrelenting sense of dread followed us everywhere we went in those woods. Though none of us dared voice it out loud, we could feel something sinister lurking beyond the shadows, an entity that hungered for us. We attempted to maintain our normal routine, laughing around the campfire and sharing old stories. Yet, despite our efforts, an invisible force slowly chipped away at our sanity. One evening, as we sat around the fire, we noticed a rustling among the trees. The sound grew closer until a strange figure appeared before us, tall and cloaked in darkness. Its disturbingly elongated limbs moved unnaturally, and our hearts skipped beats in unison as we instinctively recoiled from its presence. Mason screamed out in terror and pain, falling to the ground clutching his leg, which had been grotesquely twisted at an impossible angle. The malevolent being had struck without hesitation. Before any of us could react, it disappeared back into the darkness from whence it came. Aaron and Ken, their faces pale with fear, tried their best to care for Mason's injury as Tara and I huddled together in shock. We knew we had to leave these harrowing woods. However, with Mason unable to walk, we had no choice but to wait until morning when Ken could fetch help. The hours that followed were agonizingly long. We took turns keeping watch while trying to calm Mason's cries of agony our minds racing with unspeakable horrors. When daybreak finally arrived, my heart pounded in my chest as I watched Ken disappear down the path toward civilization. Aaron and Tara had managed to fashion makeshift splints for Mason using branches and shoelaces. I felt sick just looking at him. As Tara whispered words of comfort to her brother, I wish dearly for a distraction from our desperation, a dim hope that everything might still be all right. Desperate to help Mason and momentarily escape our current situation, I decided to look for food and water in the surrounding forest. Aaron and Tara agreed it would be best for the group while they continued tending to Mason's injuries. Although I didn't want to leave them vulnerable, there wasn't any choice. As I navigated through the dense foliage, I stumbled upon a disturbing scene. There were several dead animals scattered around a makeshift altar, their blood staining the stone's surface. 
A sharp chill ran through the air, despite the sun shining overhead. The sinister discovery had clearly been recent, and it was obvious that whoever did this was still lurking nearby. My body tensed up as I realized that we weren't alone. I hurried back towards our campsite but stopped short when I heard hushed voices speaking in unfamiliar tones. I carefully peered through the bushes and saw a figure talking on a walkie-talkie, a man with long, greasy hair and piercing eyes. He wore tattered clothes and seemed to be giving orders to someone else on the other end of the line. Without thinking, I snapped a branch from my hiding spot, hoping to record his face and voice on my phone as evidence of what we'd discovered. The man immediately noticed me, his eyes narrowing in anger, before he began chasing after me with incredible speed. Fear fueled my sprint back to camp, where Aaron and Tara were still attending to Mason. Out of breath, I managed to stammer out what I'd seen before the sounds of chaos erupted around us, someone or something crashing through the underbrush toward our location. We quickly gathered what limited supplies we had and headed away from camp in hopes of finding assistance or shelter from our pursuer. Hours later, exhaustion finally caught up with us, especially Mason, who could barely move anymore. So we found a temporary hiding spot within an abandoned shack we came across while evading our pursuer and that eerie altar. The next morning, our attention was diverted by an unexpected call from Ken. He'd reached the nearest town and alerted the local authorities to our situation. They planned to send a search party out for us, guided by a man named Gil who knew the forest well. Relief washed over us at the prospect of escaping this nightmare. As we waited for rescue, Gil found us in the shack, claiming to have recognized our tracks while aiding the search party. He assured us that help was on its way and offered to stay with us until they arrived. His presence provided us with a glimmer of hope amidst our horrifying ordeal. However, as I listened to Gil's tales about untold evils lurking within the forest, I noticed on his arm a tattoo bearing remarkable similarities to the markings around that gruesome altar. A shadow of doubt suddenly crept up inside me, growing stronger as I remembered the man on the walkie-talkie. Just when I thought Gil would expose himself as our tormentor, an alarming scream echoed in the distance. My fears were realized when he sprang into action with unnatural speed. The search party finally arrived, giving chase as Gil fled into the trees. We later learned from one of them that Gil had been a local recluse related to several unsolved missing person cases. This badly twisted individual held delusions of dark supernatural powers and had been preying upon unsuspecting victims in these woods for years. Our harrowing ordeal came to an end as we were escorted back to civilization. Although we found solace in making it out alive, we still couldn't shake off the knowledge that our antagonist remained free waiting and plotting his next twisted strike on some new unsuspecting souls who dared enter his domain. We could only hope for justice one day and pray for those who might still encounter Gil in those forsaken woods. It was June 14th. 2017, when my friends Tony, Vance, and I decided to head out of town on a much-needed camping trip. We were meeting up with a few other college buddies for the weekend at Lake Washita in Arkansas. We were all eager to leave the stresses of work and city life behind us. Little did we know that our excursion would turn into an unimaginable nightmare. Arriving at our campsite, we quickly set up tents and unpacked our gear. As the sun dipped below the horizon, we gathered around the campfire, laughing and reminiscing about old times. 
Kevin walked by with a plate full of freshly cooked hot dogs, amusingly balancing them in one hand as he expertly dodged tree branches. The next day brought clear skies and a dazzling sun. We spent the morning hiking through the beautiful wilderness that surrounded us. As we made our trek back to camp, Kate noticed a peculiar symbol carved into one of the trees along our path. It looked like an eerily intricate maze intertwined with strange markings. None of us knew what it meant, but soon enough, we forgot about it and moved on. That evening, as we hunkered down around the fire once more, the mood had noticeably shifted. The conversation gradually dwindled as everyone became acutely aware of unsettling sounds echoing through the night distant howls and chilling whispers carried by the wind. Later that night, as I lay in my tent drifting off to sleep, I was jolted awake by an overwhelming feeling of dread that settled deep within my bones. The forest was unnervingly silent, no rustling leaves or soft animal noises, just absolute stillness. Bolting upright, I strained my ears for any hint of what might have triggered this sudden panic. Then I saw it, a faint silhouette outlined by moonlight near my tent flap, an unnaturally tall figure with elongated limbs and crooked, razor-sharp claws. The very sight of it made my skin crawl, but I was paralyzed with terror, unable to move or even breathe. The aberrant figure crept closer its movements unnervingly fluid. A gut-curdling growl grated from its throat, unlike any sound I had ever heard. Tears streamed down my face as I silently prayed for it to go away. Suddenly, Kate's terrified scream ripped through the air. The figure turned towards the noise and hurled itself towards her tent, claws gleaming wickedly in the moonlight. I finally found the strength to break free from my paralysis and leaped out of my sleeping bag, desperately trying to find something to protect myself with, a futile attempt against an unknown nemesis. In that instant, Tony yelled out from his tent across the campsite, Everyone in the van! Now! I didn't hesitate. Running blindly in the night, I collided with Vance and we both sprinted towards Tony's van as if our lives depended on it, and they did. Our hearts raced as we fumbled for the door handles. As soon as all five of us piled in, Tony slammed on the gas pedal, and we sped away from what should have been a fun weekend getaway. Behind us, that horrendous creature tore through our tents, its unearthly cries echoing through the night air a warning that our escape was fleeting. As we hurtled down the dark forest road, uncertainty and fear gripped our thoughts. Our tires screeched against the gravel as Tony navigated the winding roads leading away from the campsite. With each twist and turn, we could hear the creature's cries becoming more and more distant. I dared not look back. My heart pounded fiercely in my chest and I could feel my palms growing clammy while gripping the door handle. As we reached the main road, Tony finally slowed down. Lisa mumbled something about the police, but Kyle argued that no one would believe us if we reported a creature like that. Besides, even if they did make it back to our destroyed campsite, there was no guarantee they'd be able to contain or catch it. We drove until we reached a small town and checked into a motel for the night. Although we were exhausted, none of us slept well, haunted by nightmares of that horrifying creature. The next day, my friend Sarah, who had stayed in the motel room across from ours, knocked on our door with some news. While sipping her morning coffee in the motel's diner, she overheard a conversation between an older local patron and a teenage employee. They spoke about a creature known as Netherthorn, who had been rumored to haunt these woods for decades. Curious but feeling cautious, 
Sarah decided to learn more from them. Sarah discovered decades ago that Netherthorn was once home to a forest ranger named Thomas Harvey, who had a devoted love for this area's natural beauty. Everyone remembered Thomas favoring these woods above all else in his life. Not even his family came before them. One fateful evening, after seeking shelter during a storm, Thomas found something ominous lurking deep within the heart of the forest, a malevolent force that consumed him entirely. This unknown dark power morphed Thomas into the dreadful netherthorn he now existed as, his only desire being to terrorize intruders who ventured too far into his beloved territory. When Sarah shared this information, a chilling sense enveloped the room, settling heavily on each of us. Despite our disbelief in the supernatural, it was now impossible to deny the truth. The creature we'd encountered was none other than the notorious Netherthorn. We decided it would be best not to involve the police after all. What could they do against a creature driven by an otherworldly force? Instead, we chose to vacate that area as soon as possible and vowed never to return. The long drive home was filled with silence and tense reflections upon our unexpected brush with Netherthorn. His dreadful image, now intertwined with the story we'd learned, burned into our memories. We couldn't forget those eerie cries or the feeling of imminent danger. In the weeks that followed, I managed to regain some semblance of normality in my daily life. But every now and then, on dark nights when the wind carried a distant wail, I'd remember how close we came to becoming victims of Netherthorn's wrath. And I'd pray for those who unknowingly ventured too deep into those forsaken woods, that they might escape before it was too late. For me and my friends, those woods were sealed away in our darkest memories as a place we could never dare enter again. The consequences of such a foolish act were unthinkable. Yet, somewhere out there, beneath twisted branches and shadowed leaves, old Thomas Harvey, Netherthorn, still waits for his next prey, proving that some stories are better left buried in the deepest recesses of forgotten legends. As a Native American living in the desolate outskirts of the Sonoran Desert, Arizona, I had encountered many strange occurrences in my time. But nothing could have prepared me for the terrifying ordeal I was about to experience. I remember the exact date as if it were branded into my memory, July 17, 1994. Strolling through my Tucson neighborhood one stifling afternoon, I couldn't shake off an increasingly oppressive sensation. The scorching sun seemed to suck away not only the air around us but also every ounce of energy from my body. As I tried to regain my composure, a peculiar smell invaded my nostrils. It was repulsive yet familiar and entirely out of place in this usually arid desert. Continuing my walk, I noticed an unnatural silence enveloping me, making me feel even more uneasy. At that moment, another neighbor stopped abruptly to call out a greeting. Struggling to stay upbeat and steer clear of uneasy thoughts, I quipped, Is it just me or does it smell like something died in the neighborhood? And let out an awkward laugh. My neighbor looked puzzled but slowly replied, with just a hint of concern. You know what? You're right. I thought it was just the garbage guy missing our block again, but this stench is way beyond that. Later that evening, as darkness descended upon us and the temperature cooled slightly, those familiar noises you'd expect to hear in any everyday suburban setting were absent. No distant laughter of kids playing outside or fighting siblings through open windows. Nothing but deafening silence. 
This crushing quietude cornered me inside my own house like an unwelcome guest. It wasn't until late into the night that I found myself being jolted awake by a loud crash echoing barely perceptible screams from somewhere in our neighborhood. Rushing to my window, all semblance of calm is now shattered. A sudden icy breeze seemingly brushes through my entire being. Squinting into the darkness, a tall and grotesque figure lurking only yards away caught my eye. Its twisted limbs appeared to be a nightmarish fusion of humans and something ominous. Almost involuntarily, I uttered a gasp and ducked out of sight, my heart pounding as if trying to burst from my chest. By some cosmic joke, fate had handed me the nastiest card in its deck, a legendary creature so monstrous. It was whispered about only in hushed tones among Native American folk discussions. I lacked the information I knew I needed, but even if given time to investigate, the alternatives were unthinkable. Clutching my cell phone tightly, I dialed my sister's number, barely able to choke down the fear surging through me. Melissa. I hissed urgently into the phone when she responded groggily from sleep. You've got to come to get me right now. There's something outside and it's terrifying. Her initial disbelief quickly melted away as she detected the genuine panic in what I conveyed. All right, she replied, now fully awake and alarmed. Stay hidden and don't make any noise. We're coming over right now. The line went dead as she hung up. Excruciating seconds soon turned into unbearable minutes as the indescribable beast tore relentlessly into someone, or something, that pleaded for their life amid sickening screeches echoing in our otherwise quiet street. In the distance, the flickering headlights of an approaching car grew nearer, its engine humming lacked mercy, lulling me into false security that rescue loomed close and it would all be over soon enough. As the car approached, its headlights illuminated the gruesome scene outside my hiding spot. The creature, now clearly visible, had the twisted body of a man and the grotesque features of a goat, tangled in a bloody mess of fur and horn. It was the infamous Jersey Devil, a nightmare from local folklore, that haunted these parts. My neighbor, Mr. Thompson, had told me stories of it before but I had always dismissed them as mere legends. Now, faced with reality, I tried to quiet my shaking breaths as the beast surveyed its surroundings with malicious glee. The car's engine stopped abruptly, and a door slammed shut. Too terrified to move or scream for help, I squeezed my eyes shut and prayed for a miracle. A sudden burst of gunfire erupted just outside my hiding spot. I flinched at each shot, my heart pounding painfully in my chest as silence fell once more on the street. My hands were clammy as I forced myself to peek through a small opening in the curtains. The creature lay motionless on the ground, blood pooling around it as its mouth hung open in a silent snarl. Relief washed over me as I saw Mr. Thompson's figure near his pickup truck. He was clutching a smoking rifle and appeared to be saying something into his cell phone. Sirens wailed in the distance, growing louder by the second, as other neighbors emerged from their homes cautiously, their faces pale and haggard from fear. Together, we assessed each other for any visible injuries but found none. Paramedics arrived on scene first, followed by police officers who seemed horrified at what they found outside our homes. Residuals of its grisly massacre scattered along the once peaceful suburban street. We gave our statements and watched as wildlife control arrived to remove the lifeless creature from our midst. It wouldn't be until later that we learned for sure that it was indeed none other than the legendary Jersey Devil a local myth that had come to life on our street that night. Hushed whispers spread like wildfire, and news vans lined the street, 
eager for an exclusive interview with any of us. In the days following the attack, I found little comfort in my once familiar home. Fearful of what other terrors might be lurking just outside my doorstep, sleep was a distant memory, and jumpy nerves were my new normal. Mr. Thompson acted as a guardian of sorts, watching over our neighborhood and speaking softly with anyone who questioned the creature's origin or intent. One evening, after consulting with a specialist in local folklore, he approached my house bearing a peculiar bundle he said would protect us from further harm. Placing a small wooden goat figurine on the porch, he muttered an incantation in a language I didn't recognize, bidding farewell as he made his way back to his own home. As I stood there, staring at the statue now guarding my house, I couldn't help but shudder at what might still be out there, watching, waiting for its chance to strike again. But for now, we were safe under Mr. Thompson's watchful eye and his mysterious wooden guardian. The memory of that night will forever haunt me, but somehow life goes on for those of us who survived. We may never understand why it chose our neighborhood or what drove it mad enough to attack. All we can do is continue living and pray that whatever darkness brought it here will keep its distance. In this close-knit community where trust was once our strongest bond, we now cling to one another for dear life, unwilling to face any future horrors alone. I still glance nervously out my window, often wondering if the calm is merely a brief reprieve before the chaos returns. Only time will tell if evil truly has been vanquished from our lives, but until then, the memory of that dreadful night and the specter of the Jersey Devil continues to haunt our every waking moment. My heart thundered in my chest as I closed the creaky gate behind me and surveyed my new workplace. It had only been six months since I landed this job as a night guard at a junkyard, situated on the outskirts of a small town in Michigan called Tottenville. Some people might think it's creepy to be working from dusk until dawn among discarded cars and machinery, but I kind of liked it. The solitude was a nice change of pace, and all those rusty carcasses made for great metal sculptures, plus I had a ton of joke material to use with my friends. Kicking off another night shift, I strolled through the rows of disfigured vehicles, humming to myself. As the darkness shrouded the area and the cool breeze grazed my cheeks, I couldn't help but feel quite comfortable in this eerily tranquil setting. Unexpectedly, though, what should have been another uneventful night took a spine-chilling turn when I stumbled upon a mutilated animal corpse, something that had unfortunately become all too common these past few weeks. The mangled remains sent a wave of revulsion over me. It was clear that whatever did this was not human. Everything changed rather abruptly after that. Paranoia began to seep in as whispers of an old country bogeyman surfaced throughout the community. Bizarre incidents occurred with increasing frequency around the junkyard, vanishing tools, strange shadows cast by moonlight, and even more sinister, grotesque killings of animals found near the town's surrounding areas. On this particular night, however, something felt different, wrong even. The atmosphere was charged with an unsettling energy that made every hair on my body stand up straight. My coworker Ricky, a big guy who loves his mom's meatloaf, suggested we split up and cover more ground during our patrol rounds. We exchanged uneasy glances before going our separate ways into the gloom. As I passed a row of ancient-looking tractors, a peculiar smell hit my nostrils. It wasn't the normal rusty, oily odor that usually hung in the air. No, this was a more rank, decaying stench. 
I shook off the disturbance and carried on with my patrol route. Suddenly, this ethereal fog crept in from the shadows, enshrouding every inch of the yard. My heart raced as I tried to navigate through the dense mist, apprehensive of what might lurk in its depths. I grasped my flashlight tightly, casting its beam into every nook and cranny of machinery. A guttural and almost animalistic noise echoed through the fog. It sounded distant but like it was coming from all around me. Every instinct urged me to bolt, but I knew running blindly would only put me in more danger. Ricky's voice crackled over our walkie-talkies. Hey, man! Did you hear that? Are you seeing this? I responded hastily. Yeah, don't freak out. Let's just stick to you. A sharp pain cut through my abdomen as something slammed into my side, causing me to double over and drop the walkie-talkie. The flashlight flickered as it crashed onto the ground, emitting a distorted glow that revealed a grotesque mass of distorted limbs and mismatched appendages writhing among decaying flesh. My eyes widened at the sight of this horrifying monstrosity. Something spawned from the nightmares of ancient folklore. Truly an abomination like none I had ever seen before. Struggling to take deep breaths amidst the dread that consumed me, I willed myself to stay calm and assess the situation. The beast seemed focused on its eerie dance through the fog when suddenly it ceased all motion and jerkily turned towards me what appeared to be numerous disjointed eyes locking onto mine with an intensity that froze me in place. As I stayed impossibly still, the creature grew increasingly agitated, its many limbs flailing and its grotesque mouth snapping. In the distant fog, I heard Ricky's frantic shouts. Hey! Come on, man! Where are you? We need to get out of here! It was clear he was unaware of my perilous encounter. Using every ounce of courage, I held my ground and managed to shout at the top of my lungs. Ricky! Help! It's over here! As I did so, the grotesque creature seemed to become more agitated, its malformed limbs trembling uncontrollably. I knew my time was running out. Just as the nightmare before me prepared to lunge, Ricky emerged from the fog and threw an improvised Molotov cocktail at the creature. The flames engulfed it, but instead of recoiling, it let out a terrible howl and charged towards us. We evaded its attack and made a break for the security trailer near the junkyard entrance. Once safely inside, we barricaded the door with anything we could find, shelves, desks, and even a mini-fridge. We watched through a slit between two planks of wood as the creature continued to shriek outside, its movements growing increasingly frantic. It smashed at vehicles and picked up huge chunks of metal in a fit of rage. As we caught our breaths, we realized that this beast bore striking resemblance to an old local legend, the Tottenville Horror. Our co-worker Sharon had mentioned it weeks ago during lunch break. She had heard stories about a terrifying creature that roamed the surrounding woods and protected its territory with brutal efficiency. Like many legends before it, we didn't pay much heed. But as we stood there in our makeshift fortress and looked upon it now under duress, we could no longer dismiss it as just a story. As we weighed our options inside the trailer, beyond what felt like flimsy protection against its relentless onslaught, we argued whether or not to try calling for help independently or take on the monstrosity ourselves. We knew that explaining a local myth may not generate any immediate response from the police or other emergency help providers. Taking matters into our own hands was crucial to ensuring both ours and potentially others' safety. Determined to put an end to this horror, we decided to quietly sneak out of the trailer and search for anything that could be used as a weapon. 
we found rusty crowbars, chains, and shovels, as well as jars of chemicals that we hoped would slow it down, if not harm it in any way. With our arsenal at the ready, we stepped outside again, our hearts pounding from a combination of adrenaline and terror. We approached carefully watching the beast tear through the junkyard with deadly attentiveness. We knew this was going to be dangerous. There was no going back now. As we moved closer, Ricky offered me a reassuring nod, and I prepared myself for the inevitable gruesome encounter. Suddenly, his walkie-talkie crackled, and Sharon's voice cut through. Guys, I called in help. They said they'd be here soon. We couldn't stop our plan. We had to keep the creature busy until reinforcements arrived. In a coordinated effort, we launched our attack at the Tottenville Horror. The creature caught off guard and reeled back from rusty metal spikes piercing its convoluted limbs. One jar of caustic chemicals burst open on impact with its contorted face, causing it to howl in agony. Ricky managed to wrap a chain around some of its limbs, restricting its frenzied rage momentarily. But then something unexpected happened. The Tottenville horror screeched, something more painful than frightening, before vanishing into the fog just as mysteriously as it had appeared. Left standing surrounded by the destruction, Ricky and I were astounded yet relieved by what had transpired in those terrifying moments. As inexplicable as everything had been, starting with the fog unveiling it until that last dreaded screech, the realization dawned that perhaps it was better not knowing all answers or forcing delving deeper into unfamiliar dark realms. All we knew for certain was that, at least for tonight, the town still had its protectors fighting for it. Sharon's voice came through the walkie-talkie again. They're here! Help is here! It seemed as though leaving the creature to mystery and focusing on our own survival was the best hope we had. Our actions, however short-lived or incomprehensible they may have been, must have worked on some level allowing hope to prevail in a losing battle against an indestructible horror. In response to my coughing fit, my co-worker, Sergei, laughed heartily and joked, Looks like you had a little too much vodka last night, Ivan. Truth be told, I wasn't much of a drinker. In fact, I was focused on my work as a Russian forest ranger stationed in the Pripyat region. I shook my head and chuckled along with him. Then, our day officially began. As rangers, we often had to patrol the massive forest expanse and help any lost hikers or climbers in distress. These ordinary responsibilities filled our days with countless stories to share when we returned home each evening. After saying our goodbyes, I grabbed my walkie-talkie and set off on my usual route through the dense woods with a light heart. The sun was shining, and a gentle breeze rustled through the leaves high above. For several hours, nothing seemed out of the ordinary until I noticed odd footprints in the damp soil ahead of me. They didn't look human, or even animal-like for that matter, but they seemed too deliberate to be a random occurrence. Whatever made them left deep indentations in the ground, as if carrying an enormous weight. My curiosity was piqued. I followed the path cautiously. As it unfolded before me, a sharp metal odor hit me right in the face that made me wince. Upon leaving the footprints behind, I stumbled upon something terrible, a mutilated body badly burned and partially buried among decaying plants. I knew I had to report this gruesome finding immediately. However, as I tried to reach Sergei via walkie-talkie, it refused to work correctly. An eerie distortion filled each of my calls for help. 
Sergei finally responded after multiple attempts, asking me where I was located exactly. I was unsure of my exact coordinates due to interference with my compass, which was behaving erratically as well. Something was very wrong here. Unable to wait for assistance, I decided to investigate further, against my better judgment. I followed a nearby trail of crushed foliage and broken branches that seemed too extensive for an animal to make. The tension in the air was palpable as I cautiously walked, or rather, inched, forward. Suddenly, my voice caught in my throat as the area opened up into a chilling scene. A crude shelter made from sticks and leaves hosted the carcasses of various wildlife, littered about haphazardly. Strange symbols painted crudely onto rocks stared back at me, seemingly reaching into the darkest depths of reality to haunt me. Between the twisted bodies and crudely beaten tools, I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever creature created this macabre scene was still nearby. Underneath all my logic and skepticism, I knew there was no rational explanation for what lay before me. The sickening smells mixed with overwhelming dread when I heard a god-awful noise echoing through the trees, an almost human-sounding cry of pain and anger intertwined bizarrely. It occurred to me then that I had not encountered any other forest rangers on patrol, nor had I received any response from Sergei, despite my multiple attempts using the walkie-talkie. My thoughts began racing as panic set in. Who or what made those noises? What happened to Sergei? And why didn't help appear yet? As if mocking my predicament, a deep, rumbling growl shook me out of my thoughts. Peering cautiously in the sound's direction, there it was, a behemoth standing taller than any man-made terror, covered in patches of fur and rotting flesh. The distorted face appeared sewn together with pieces from its various victims' bandaged remains, with hate-filled eyes glaring directly into mine. A grotesque foot slammed down onto the forest floor as it took a menacing step closer, signaling impending doom if I didn't do something soon. The creature bared its blood-stained teeth and lunged toward me, my trembling hands unable to find any potential weapon. My body begged me to run, but my feet refused, frozen in terror. The creature's looming figure continued its approach menacingly as I struggled with the urge to turn and flee. The sudden realization that I needed to escape this monstrosity coming at me washed over me like a tidal wave. As the creature advanced, I forced my legs to move and started sprinting through the forest trying to remember which direction I had come from. As I stumbled through the dense undergrowth, I could hear unnatural screeching sounds behind me, mixed with snapping twigs and scattering wildlife. Heart pounding in my chest, footsteps echoing relentlessly through the woods, my panicked breathing labored heavily. My training as a ranger should have prepared me better for moments like this but the terror felt too overwhelming to think rationally. The creature continued to pursue me, remaining terrifyingly close. As I ran further from the horrific scene, my surroundings started to become more familiar. Through the dense foliage, I spotted a small cabin where a family of local hunters lived. Desperate for assistance, I approached the cabin hastily and banged on their door. The patriarch of the family answered with a puzzled expression on his face. Victor, I panted breathlessly as he opened the door. There's something out there. Something monstrous and horrifying. The man surveyed his surroundings suspiciously before letting me into his home. His wife performed immediate first aid on me while Victor questioned my story in detail. He showed concern over something brutal enough to leave warped trails throughout their hunting grounds. After recounting my tale of terror and showing him my malfunctioning walkie-talkie and compass, 
Victor tightly gripped his hunting knife and decided it was time for him to see this nightmarish situation firsthand. He cautiously led us back into the woods, towards where I had encountered the beast-like creature. As we approached the crude shelter filled with carcasses, we smelled a burning stench thickening in the air. It was clear that something had set fire to whatever lay behind us. I know of someone who may help us better understand what we are dealing with, Victor said darkly as we surveyed the scene. A scholar of ancient legends who lives a few miles from here. Though her knowledge is more focused on supernatural folklore, she might give us insight into what this thing is and where it may have come from. We trekked in uncomfortable silence towards the scholar's residence. Upon arrival, we found ourselves in a small, isolated house belonging to an elderly woman named Isfer. She welcomed us in and listened intently as we shared our chilling account. Esfer pondered over our descriptions and informed us that the creature in question seemed to resemble the infamous Vadiana, a brutal spirit that inhabited bodies of water and sought to punish those who trespassed on its domain. However, this particular entity appeared to have escalated its attacks and acquired new adaptations that aligned it with mutated abominations. The disturbing new information weighed heavily on our minds as Victor and I returned to our respective homes. We vowed to take the necessary precautions and share this knowledge with other rangers and residents in the area. However, fear remained palpable among everyone involved. There was an overriding sense that none could escape the wrath of this being. In the days following our discoveries, Further signs of the same mutilated den populated the vast woodland landscape. The more knowledge people acquired of this mysterious entity, the more they stayed away from murky waters and the shadowy depths of the wilderness. While many hunters reported sightings of a grotesque, lumbering figure roaming through the darkness, it crawled into their worst fears but spared them from any physical harm, for now. Deep within the heart of darkness lie secrets that even those closest to understanding cannot comprehend. As we went about our lives, avoiding wandering too far into secluded areas and glancing anxiously towards their murky depths, there was a resigned realization that we would never be completely free from terror's tenacious grip. The vicious creature haunted our forest, lying in wake, prepared to enact its eternal rage upon anyone who crossed its path. My name is Sebastian Spencer, and among my closest friends, I'm known for my clumsiness. I swear, sometimes it feels like I can trip over air. But enough about me, let me tell you about something that happened. My childhood friend Dave and I decided to take a trip to Alaska for a much-needed vacation. We wanted to experience the beauty of the Alaskan wilderness, so we rented a cabin in the remote town of Moose Pass. Outside of Moose Pass, we discovered a little-known hiking trail with the promise of unparalleled scenic views. Excited by our find, we geared up and embarked on what was supposed to be a two-hour hike at most. Little did we know that our journey would take a terrifying turn. As we trekked along the trail, we came across a rather disturbing sight. We found an abandoned campsite with torn tents and scattered belongings. It was clear that whoever had been camping there left in a hurry. Dave couldn't help but laugh at my terrified face, joking that it was probably just an angry moose that scared them off. We decided to go deeper into the forest, even though my gut told me otherwise. Half an hour later, we stumbled upon an area with shredded clothing and a gun thrown against a tree trunk. The remains still looked fresh, 
almost as if they had been abandoned this very day, nervously laughing at each other's bad jokes. None of us wanted to admit how downright unsettled we were beginning to feel. Suddenly, Dave and I heard rustling from behind us. A monstrous creature appeared just meters from where we stood. Tall as any man but disproportionate in its build due to its straight raven black fur that looked almost oily shimmering in contrast against oozing sores amidst exposed putrid meat-like flesh underneath. It had deep-set eyes radiating menace under prominent brow ridges, its blood-stained teeth protruding against crooked maw taut with menace. I looked at Dave, words lost in fear as we exchanged wide-eyed exclamations, suggesting the terrifying realization that Bigfoot might be real. And it was standing right in front of us. With a roar that shook the very ground we were on, the creature charged towards us with incredible speed. Dave and I bolted, barely avoiding its malicious grasp as we frantically sprinted through the dense forest. Our hearts pounded, and our lungs burned. We found refuge behind a fallen tree, our chests heaving as we struggled to catch our breaths without making a sound. We weren't sure if the Bigfoot could hear us but decided to risk taking a peek around the corner of our hiding spot. To our horror, we saw it, lunging toward another group of hikers just up ahead who were unsuspectingly continuing their hike with no idea of the terror that awaited them. With its enormous limbs flailing and teeth gnashing in a frenzy for vicious destruction, we couldn't just stand there and let those innocent hikers meet the same fate as the others. Dave and I quickly stepped out of our hiding spot, yelling at the group to run. Confusion swept across their faces, but they didn't hesitate to start sprinting in the opposite direction as the monstrous creature was momentarily distracted by us. Dave and I took off again returning to the abandoned campsite we had previously discovered. We desperately searched for any means of communication or tools that could help us in this dire situation. Our search paid off when Dave found a satellite phone inside one of the torn tents. Its previous owners were unable to retrieve it amidst their panic. We decided that calling for help was our best bet. With more people aware of the danger, we could protect ourselves and potentially save those who crossed paths with the menacing beast. With shaky hands, I dialed the local forest ranger station and hoped fervently that they would receive our distress call. As the call connected, I described our encounter with the horrifying creature in a hurried voice. The ranger, on the other end, sympathized with our horror but doubted our story guessing it was perhaps just an abnormally large bear or an illusion caused by stress. Dave and I exchanged frustrated glances, knowing they wouldn't fully understand unless they saw it themselves. Despite their dismissal, we somehow managed to persuade them to send a team to investigate, in addition to warning other hikers about a potential threat lurking in these woods. As we ended the call, we realized that staying near the campsite was no longer a safe option, so we began trekking back toward town through an alternate route provided by one of the rangers. Throughout our return journey, we felt like we were being watched. Whether it was paranoia or reality, we couldn't tell. A few days after our harrowing experience, we learned via a news report that authorities had found remains in a cave near the trail we'd hiked, concluding that a wild animal had been behind the attacks. However, when a local expert on Alaskan wildlife was asked for his opinion, he said that none of the animals indigenous to the area could cause this level of destruction. Dave and I, now back in the safety of our own homes, couldn't shake the feeling that we knew what was responsible, that hideous entity we had encountered in the forest. Recounting our experience to others, 
we came across an individual who claimed to have heard similar stories about terrifying encounters with an ancient creature people referred to as the Ravenous One. His knowledge about such stories and the striking similarities between them convinced us more than ever that this mysterious antagonist not only existed but was entirely separate from any known natural species. We never found out if authorities believed us or if they managed to fend off. The Ravenous One. But we knew one thing for sure. Newfound nightmares would haunt us forever. As time passed, Dave and I continued to share our story with others, hoping that by bringing attention to this horrifying creature's existence, perhaps someday someone might unravel its true nature, origins, and motives. But deep down inside, a chilling sensation never left us, leading us to believe that the ravenous one still roamed those woods, ready to strike again at unsuspecting victims. I had always been fascinated by codes and ciphers, which eventually led me to my job as a CIA agent. Little did I know that my penchant for patterns would lead me into the most unnerving experience of my life. My partner for this classified mission, Reginald Hargrove, was someone I could count on for just about anything. Our assignment brought us to a secluded forest in West Virginia alleged to be home to a notorious criminal who had evaded capture for almost a decade. Reginald and I arrived in the town bordering the forest, settling into a nondescript motel as our base. The locals here were not very talkative, but they all seemed to have their fair share of stories about their mysterious neighbor who lived in the woods. The constant whispers among the townsfolk only heightened our determination to close in on this elusive figure. Early one morning, after painstakingly researching and mapping out the area, Reginald and I began making our way deeper into the forest. We descended through a dense patch of foliage into a gully, where we spotted something tangled in the underbrush, human bones dispersed among animal remains. Both of us were well versed in the gruesome aspects of our jobs, but coming across such a sight still made my stomach churn. Continuing forward with increased caution, we came across traces of what looked like an encampment, carefully hidden from plain sight and surrounded by thick brush and trees. Judging from the remnants, it was clear that this was no ordinary fugitive's hideout. Beyond the elaborate traps set around the area, there were symbols etched in blood on tree trunks, symbolic similar to those found in ancient folklore about mythical creatures. As we approached cautiously, trying not to disturb any tripwires or triggers among the leaf litter, Reginald spotted movement further ahead. We exchanged nervous glances before ducking behind a large tree to observe. A hulking figure, covered in hair and dirt, emerged from a hidden entrance to the makeshift lair. The creature, if it could be called that, appeared half-man, half-animal, something straight from the pages of a twisted folktale. I raised my hand to signal Reginald to radio for backup, but I was met with a horrified shake of his head. We both knew that if we alerted this thing to our presence— even in the slightest, there was no guarantee we would make it out alive. The beast's sight was focused on something else, and for now, that was our only advantage over this gruesome intruder. Our breathing was shallow as we watched the creature take notice of the human remains in the gully and lift them to offer them up to some unseen deity. It muttered unintelligible words as it placed each bone carefully into an intricate arrangement, resembling one of their sinister symbols. The urge to move came suddenly and forcefully, knowing that we had now seen too much. 
But just as I shifted my footing ever so slightly to retreat further into the forest, a branch snapped underfoot. Time slowed as the beast turned its attention toward us and let out an ear-shattering roar. My heart felt like it would explode from my chest as Reginald screamed at me to run. Sprinting through the forest away from the creature's blood-curdling snarls behind me, I wasn't sure if I made the wrong step or if it was some unseen trap, but suddenly, I found myself unable to move forward with my leg caught in an agonizing grasp. Reginald saw the terror in my eyes, realizing we were in grave danger. Without a second thought, he charged toward the beast, firing his gun in an attempt to buy me some time. The creature seemed to shrug off the bullets, unfazed, as it continued to advance toward us. A voice shouted out from deep within the woods, stopping the creature momentarily in its tracks. It was Melvin, one of the few locals who had assisted us in our investigation. We had met him during our time spent gathering information about the mysterious figure living within the forest. Remarkably knowledgeable about folklore, he had warned us about the creature we were hunting, calling it the Wendigo. Melvin yelled out a series of strange words and phrases, some sort of incantation, I presumed, as he tossed a small bag toward Reginald and me. Salt! he shouted desperately. Spread it around you now! We frantically emptied the bag's contents in a circle around us. I could feel my leg throbbing from where it had been caught earlier, but I pushed that pain aside as adrenaline coursed through my veins. The Wendigo seemed wary of the barrier surrounding us. It hesitated before eventually retreating back into its lair. Melvin approached cautiously and laid out a plan to drive the Wendigo away from the area without harming it further. Despite being a part of ancient folklore, Killing such beings was believed to bring misfortune upon those who committed the act. Why didn't you call for backup? Melvin was questioned as we packed up our temporary campsite and destroyed any remaining evidence of our presence in this cursed forest. We couldn't, Reginald replied simply. Uncertainty filled his voice as he glanced back at Melvin. If we had alerted anyone else to our location once we found its lair. Well, I don't think any amount of backup would have saved us from that thing. We heeded Melvin's advice and spent the next few days luring the Wendigo further away from the town by leaving a trail of animal carcasses, much to our disgust. We hoped that by leading it on a path away from human civilization, we could protect both the inhabitants of West Virginia and its local forests. After returning to town, we made our official report, leaving certain gruesome details as classified to protect the townspeople and dissuade others from seeking out the Wendigo. We spread rumors about a hazardous waste spill in the region, a necessary fabrication in order to save lives. As Reginald and I left West Virginia for good, I couldn't help but look back at those dense woods for one last glimpse, a mistake for which I'll forever pay. The Wendigo's piercing eyes stared back at me from within the darkness, its presence reminding me that while we had driven it away temporarily, it would never truly be gone. The moment I discovered several scattered teeth while walking my dog in the park that chilly November morning was the moment my tranquil life took an appalling turn. We were enjoying our regular stroll in Cooper River Park, nestled perfectly in Camden County, New Jersey. The vibrant shades of yellow and orange leaves created a perfect canvas for what I thought would be a peaceful day. My name is Orville Hutchins and I work as an understated tax consultant, finding solace in poring over numbers and assisting my clients. I never considered myself anything extraordinary or out of the ordinary. 
until that horrifying day. God! I remember exclaiming, Sky, what have you found here? My well-mannered golden retriever obediently dropped the small, glistening object she had picked up with her mouth. Upon closer examination, it was apparent that she stumbled upon something both repulsive and alarming, human molars. I immediately dialed 911 on my phone while keeping an eye on my surroundings. I explained the situation quickly, asserted that there wasn't any imminent crisis, but requested an officer to assess the scene nonetheless. As I waited, Sky couldn't help but grow curious about the teeth again. An ice cream truck jingle suddenly echoed through our section of the park, and Sky nearly cackled with laughter at it. My only happy memory of that entire dreadful day. When the officers arrived, they looked around in bewilderment as they examined the finds. It wasn't just teeth. There were also bits of clothing strewn about haphazardly throughout the park. There were no signs of struggle or blood anywhere to be found, just these bizarre remnants left for someone like me to find accidentally. After assisting with the scene, I was urged to go home by the officers. And while every effort was made to provide reassurance that this heinous discovery would be followed up on in earnest, I couldn't help but worry about what I had stumbled upon. The next day, more strange occurrences plagued the members of our community. A group of joggers spotted a menacing figure in the woods, a creature with the form of a man but twisted and unnerving. It stood tall with twisting bramble-like horns growing atop its head and coarse, goat-like fur draped around its body. Its eyes held an otherworldly blackness that unsettled and chilled anyone who met their gaze. Though the creature lay at a distance, the joggers could faintly perceive goat hooves in place of human feet. Instinctively, we all placed calls to local law enforcement for guidance and protection. Although they were quick to respond, nothing apprehended this haunting creature. As days turned into an agonizing week, our entire community was gripped by fear. Then came that terrible night when I chanced upon this monstrous being in my very own backyard. Sky had frantically woken me up with her whining. She was too old to fuss without good reason. Creeping down the darkened hallway, I looked out my kitchen windows onto the moonlit yard. That's when my heart seized within my chest as I saw it there. That ghastly amalgamation of man and goat standing beneath the gnarled oak tree adjacent to my garden shed. Its shadowed form extended itself towards me a grotesque silhouette against the shimmering backdrop of stars. Without even realizing it, I gasped aloud. This was the cursed creature terrorizing our town. It seemed to sense my presence as it maliciously lifted its eerie fingers and began scratching at the side of my house, curling tendrils echoing grotesquely through the calm night air. I retreated from the window and frantically dialed 911 again while hushing Sky to remain quiet. The keeper at the emergency hotline breathlessly asked me to stay on the line as they dispatched officers to my address. Suddenly, I heard an intense crash of breaking glass in the living room, followed by an angry snort that could only belong to a malicious beast. I knew I had no other choice. As I held on to the line, whispering my account of the intrusion, Sky's eyes stared unrelentingly at the doors separating us from that monstrous being. The horrifying sound of cloven hooves clicking down my hallway crawled inside us while eerie scratching persisted in tandem. My heart pounded as I clung to Sky in the hallway. The commotion grew nearer, and dread consumed me. I whispered my plea to the 911 operator. Please hurry. It's inside my house. I retreated with Sky into the nearest room, barricading ourselves inside. The sounds of shattering furniture and possessions echoed from the living room. Amidst the chaos, I heard the angry snorts and grunts of this monstrous creature, and being I couldn't explain or understand. Moments later, 
Faint sirens in the distance pierced through the cacophony. Relief momentarily washed over me until I heard the creature approaching our hiding place, its hooves clicking against the hardwood floors. Trapped with no escape, Sky and I braced ourselves for the inevitable confrontation. Then something unexpected happened. A dog's barking rang out from another direction outside. Soon, more joined the chorus, my neighbor's dogs responding to the unnatural presence. The beast hesitated for a moment before turning and racing toward the source of annoyance. Glass shattered again as it left through a broken window and disappeared into darkness. When law enforcement finally arrived, we found my living room destroyed, as if a hurricane had swept through it, but no trace of that terrifying being. Over the next several days, there were sightings and attacks on animals throughout town. Mutilated remains were discovered by horrified residents. Our once peaceful community had become a nightmare-ridden battleground. Curfews were enforced, and we were urged to stay indoors at night, while investigations continued in a desperate attempt to capture this malevolent creature that had intruded into our lives. Days went by with no rest, no escape from fear, until one afternoon, when calls began flooding into local law enforcement about a disturbance at an abandoned barn on the outskirts of town. A team of officers cautiously went to investigate. The goat man stood in plain sight near that collapsing barn surrounded by unbroken woods, its enormous form twisted and menacing. As the officers cautiously approached, it simply stood there, staring them down with menacing eyes. They opted for tactics intended to subdue and capture rather than kill in order to learn more about this strange creature. It did not fight back as the officers closed in on it. Surrounded, suddenly and surprisingly, the goat man fell to his knees and then collapsed as if life had been drained from his body. It lay motionless on the ground, and the officers carefully approached, unsure of what had occurred. As they reached out to touch it, poof, its body disintegrated into ash that blew away in a gust of wind. That was the last anyone saw of it. The terror that plagued our community ended just as abruptly as it began. In the aftermath of these harrowing events, our town tried to rebuild and find normalcy once again. Grief-stricken families mourned those who had fallen victim to the horrible attacks but also held on to hope, the hope that lives would no longer be plagued by darkness. As for myself, I only found solace in knowing that I was not alone. There were other survivors with stories just as harrowing, people with whom I could share my ordeal. We vowed never to forget those terrifying days and nights nor those we lost to that monstrous being. There were no answers or reasons for why we had endured such torment, but we knew we had emerged from it stronger. Through perseverance and unity, we faced our darkest fears head-on, though we would never understand what happened during those dreadful days when our peace was shattered by a mysterious beast. I consider myself to be just an average guy. I like watching old sitcoms and complain about the weather more often than I'd like to admit. But something happened to me a few weeks ago, while I was out on a job as an exterminator, that made me reconsider just how, ordinary, my life really is. My name is Herman Dunkirk, and I've been an exterminator for over a decade. I'm used to dealing with roaches, mice, and the occasional opossum or raccoon trying to make a home in someone's garage. But this particular job took me to a small town in Idaho called Farther Frost. I had never heard of it before this assignment, but hey, it's work. Instead of my usual rodent problems, this time I was hired by a man named Bradley 
who claimed he had an infestation of strange creatures lurking in the crawl space under his house. They said they sounded like animals, but somehow they were off in some way. I arrived at his place one afternoon around 5.43 p.m., feeling irritable after spending hours identifying the right exit off the freeway. My grumbling stomach made me wish I had grabbed lunch before starting the job. Bradley greeted me with a mop of unruly hair and sweaty hands that were more palm than grip as we shook hands. The noises are loudest down here, he said nervously, leading me to a trapdoor leading under the house. We descended into darkness. I couldn't help feeling creeped out by how little light filtered through from above. Soon enough, Bradley and I came across piles of mangled clothes stashed away along with gnawed wooden beams. I suspected raccoons at first, Bradley explained as we continued through the crawl space. But when I saw those, I knew it had to be something else. At that moment, we heard unusual scraping sounds nearby. It sounded as if someone was dragging a large sack of gravel. The strange noise sent chills down my back, making me question what kind of creature we were dealing with. I clicked on my flashlight to get a better look at our surroundings. There it was, lurking mere feet away from us. The horrid thing resembled a human but was alarmingly distorted. Bulging muscles stretched its grayish skin, mouth open to reveal rows of jagged teeth and eyes that felt like they could burn through your soul. Without a moment's hesitation, the creature lunged forward towards Bradley, who screamed out in terror. Adrenaline surged through me as I tried to think logically about what to do next. I pulled out my stun gun from my belt and used it on the beast. It snarled at me in response, readying for another attack when I sprayed some pesticide towards the creature's face. It stumbled back, its skin sizzling from the chemicals, before scurrying deeper into the darkness. Are you okay? I asked Bradley, assisting him to his feet. Before he could respond, we heard more of those gut-wrenching sounds, not just one creature this time, but numerous. It was clear that we were heavily outnumbered, my fight-or-flight instinct kicked in as I came up with an escape plan. We need to get out of here. I shouted over the noises that seemed to be closing in on us. We scrambled towards the trapdoor amidst their growls and screeching, sweat pouring down our faces and our hearts pounding like drums in our chests. It felt like our lives were on the line as we raced towards safety. Once we had escaped the crawl space, Bradley slammed the trapdoor closed behind us. Our breathing was heavy, and our minds were racing with a million questions. Why didn't you call for help when you first encountered this? I asked Bradley, struggling to comprehend why someone wouldn't seek assistance when dealing with such horrors. I did, but no one believed me he said with desperation in his voice. I was labeled as a lunatic by everyone who caught wind of my story. You were my last hope. We knew we had to find out more about these creatures in order to devise a plan to rid the house of them. Our only lead was to contact a local historian who might provide some answers. We set up a meeting with an elderly woman named Agnes, who agreed to lend her expertise on the town's history. Upon meeting with Agnes, she stared intently at us, as though trying to assess how much we already knew. We decided to be open with her about our experience underneath Bradley's house. She listened intently and nodded as we recounted our experience. The creatures you describe have been part of our town's dark past for generations, Agnes began, her voice wavering. They are known as the Father Frost Fiends. She went on to explain the origins of these monstrosities, 
Once human beings who delve too heavily into dark arts and corruption, transforming into malicious entities that preyed on unsuspecting victims. After learning everything we could from Agnes, including the potential weaknesses of the creatures, we returned to Bradley's home with newfound determination and courage. Our strategy was to force them out by exploiting their vulnerability towards certain chemicals found in commercial-grade bug spray. While incapable of killing them outright, it would weaken and potentially drive them away from the area. While spraying the chemicals into the crawlspace entrance, we heard their ghastly screams of pain and frustration echo through the wooden structure. As a last resort, we placed motion-activated floodlights around the perimeter of the house, hoping it would deter them from returning. We stood at a distance, monitoring the situation all throughout the night. Though the screams seemed to subside, there was a palpable unease in the air that never lifted. A few days later, Bradley had yet to experience any more issues with the farther frost fiends. However, other residents began reporting similar encounters with these creatures around town. It seemed that by driving them out of Bradley's home, we had inadvertently spread their terror throughout farther frost. As I prepared to leave town, Feeling conflicted about my role and what had transpired, Agnes approached me. Don't beat yourself up over this, she said solemnly. These creatures will always find a way to plague the lives of those who live here. But at least you were brave enough to confront them head on. As I drove away from farther frost, watching it disappear through my rearview mirror into an uncertain future, I couldn't help but ponder the long-term consequences of our actions. Were we successful in diminishing their power, or had we only exacerbated the problem by spreading them around town? A Dreadful Encounter from Sue Hunter 91 an unnerving event I wished to forget. This happened to me on the 23rd of October, 2003. Growing up as a native Sioux in the picturesque landscapes of South Dakota, I was no stranger to the mystical stories that had surrounded our culture for centuries. My name is Elijah Blackstone, and at the time of this disturbing incident, I worked primarily as an outdoorsman, familiar with everything our sacred grounds had to offer. My life revolved around exploring the valleys and rugged terrain that conjured both cherished memories of my family and the eerie whispers of legends past. Our tale begins in a quaint little town called Miller, which seemed like any other quiet settlement that went by its mundane days in peace. This particular year, Fall's arrival brought with it nature's own dramatic performances as darkened skies hung ominously over the location. I was having a night out with friends from high school when we heard a commotion outside the bar. Alarmed patrons rushed toward the door as we joined them, curious about the cause of the uproar. We stepped out onto Main Street just in time to see an old pickup truck speeding away from scared onlookers who mumbled about something gruesome in the back. A couple of brave ones stopped their chatter and peeked into a concealed alleyway nearby. Nikki, my best friend's girlfriend, lingered behind, nervously tugging at James' arm, her eyes wide with dread. James reluctantly agreed to take a look before cautiously approaching the alley, with us following behind. The sight that greeted us was a horrendous one. Three people, local shopkeepers we recognized, lay sprawled across each other in various states of disarray. Their faces contorted in terror and agony, and blood pooled around them in sickening puddles. Any remnants of innocent fear surrounding this scene were quickly replaced by absolute horror. Why, why is this happening here? Nikki whimpered, 
and James pulled her closer to him in an attempt to provide some comfort. As recalled in the shocking discovery to local authorities, no one dared answer her question. But there was an unspoken truth we all harbored within us. The stories of our ancestors weren't the only things haunting our lands. Following the gruesome scene, a pattern of unnatural assaults emerged throughout Miller, each one leaving behind bloody remnants as garish signposts that warned of something wicked lurking in the shadows. Whispers circulated among the town's residents. A monstrous creature had descended upon us. With no witnesses to these attacks and no description of our assailant other than strange markings left at each scene, my friends and I began to fear what couldn't be seen. Just a week later, I found myself alone with Nikki's panicked voice on the other end of a phone call that turned my blood cold. James is missing. He went outside when he thought he heard his dog barking, and he never came back. Please, Elijah, help me find him. I rushed over to their place, praying with every step I took that I wasn't going to stumble headfirst into the unknown evil that had infiltrated our small corner of the world. Are you sure he didn't just? My voice trailed off as nothing could explain away her increasing terror. Omitting any further conversation for now struck me as necessary ensuring her safety was paramount. Intrigued by a broken fence near their home, I found myself venturing across darkened fields, upon which sinister tree lines lay piercing shadows amongst familiar settings. My heart raced as my ears wrestled with the silence gripping each step and the agonizing feeling of helplessness inching its way closer into my mind. When I finally reached those foreboding woods concealing our mystery tormentor behind their gates of twisted branches, only my resolve to save my friend propelled me deeper into unknown territories. As I waded through this grim wilderness, an eerie sound cut through the silence. The spine-chilling moans of someone in immense pain echoed through the brittle branches. In the distance... I caught sight of a haggard figure sprawled over low-lying foliage and covered in dark crimson stains. My pulse quickened as a heartbeat's thunder cracked against my ribs. As the moans grew louder, I mustered the courage to approach the figure cautiously. Sprinting toward it, I noticed my friend James lying on the ground, writhing in agony. Oh God, James! I yelled releasing a breath I didn't realize I was holding. I tried to stabilize him, but blood kept dripping from his body. The gashes across his chest and back left me in a state of horror. There was no option but to seek help as soon as possible. James! Don't worry, man. I'm going to get help now. I reassured him, trying to keep both our hopes alive. In reality, fear gripped every ounce of my being. I dialed 911 immediately and explained the situation, begging them to hurry while they assured me help was on its way. Leaving James on his own was risky but necessary, so I rushed back toward Nikki's house in the hope that she could help hasten their arrival. Upon reaching her home, she stood petrified on her doorstep. Following her gaze to the broken fence, my heart dropped. Nikki! Get inside the house now! I screamed at her as we caught sight of ungodly claws scraping against the shattered wood. We both darted into her home and locked every possible entry point. The terror within us multiplied tenfold when we realized something as ordinary as locks wouldn't be enough to secure our safety. Waiting for the paramedics and police had never been more agonizing. Time appeared to be an enemy, but help finally arrived. As they attended to James and began their investigation into what had caused such sinister injuries on him, Nikki and I remained inside her house, sharing dreadful details of what we had witnessed with investigators. 
We were grateful not to have encountered our assailant again that evening. The authorities searched for further clues through days that blurred into weeks. There weren't any answers, but as more victims succumbed to gruesome attacks, the town's terror escalated to new limits. Trying to convalesce from such ghastly episodes was a challenge that few in our community could overcome untrammeled. Yet we all clung on to a thread of hope that someday, our lives would return to an ounce of normalcy, a day void of bloodshed and monstrous creatures stalking from the shadows. Although James survived the ordeal, he was never quite the same after suffering that night's horrors. Who could blame him? His life now sunk into fear, and his home became reclusive as if to escape the reality festering within our town. The police investigation concluded inconclusively due to the lack of substantial evidence about the attacker. We only had those terrifying markings, remains of claws, that held us captive in their fear for years. The whispers among residents grew louder, reinforcing the idea that it was a creature beyond the comprehension of any mortal. After some time, I found out that what I've encountered was a Wendigo, a malevolent entity once believed to be a mere legend. Its insatiable hunger drove it to violently prey upon humans in cold northern forests. The townspeople did their best to protect their homes from this demonic being, adapting the resources they had at their disposal. Some residences turned into veritable fortresses over time. Through our collective efforts, we managed to repel its attacks over time, but at the expense of losing many friends and loved ones over months. In their memory, we were determined not to let it terrorize us again. Let's not meet again, Wendigo. I stood at the entrance of an abandoned warehouse, located on the outskirts of a small, rural town in Montana. The crunch of gravel beneath my boots seemed deafening, even though I knew I was far from civilization. I swept my flashlight around, curiosity and trepidation mingling within me as I studied my surroundings. The warehouse was covered in moss and vines, giving an indication that it had not been used in decades. The chain-link fence surrounding it was torn apart in multiple locations, providing ample opportunities for unauthorized entry. As I stepped over the broken fence and approached the entrance cautiously, I noticed an acrid odor permeating the air, something akin to decay mixed with chemicals. Pausing for a brief moment to take a deep breath, I reminded myself that this wasn't just another routine mission. My unit, a top-secret division of Native Americans tasked with hunting down nightmarish creatures from folklore, had sent me here after receiving unsettling reports from the locals about unusual activities taking place inside this warehouse. Suddenly, the door creaked open just enough to let out a soft moan that unsettled my nerves further. A chill ran down my spine as I clenched my fist around the flashlight and stepped inside. The darkness seemed to swallow most of the light as I moved deeper into the warehouse. Crates and boxes were strewn all over the place, some toppled over as if they'd been thrown aside by something powerful and impatient. In one corner lay what looked like a pile of rags, until I flashed my light upon it and discovered it was actually a disheveled man, unconscious but still breathing. Hey! I called out to him, hoping to get some answers, but decided not to press further when he showed no signs of response. Who knew how long he had been lying there? As I continued exploring the musty corridors filled with cobwebs and debris, an unnerving sound reached my ears a scuttling noise echoing through the shadows. Anticipating an imminent confrontation, I gripped my firearm tight, 
my finger resting uncomfortably just outside the trigger guard. Then, without the slightest warning, a grotesque figure lunged towards me from the darkness, its foul breath hot against my face. It resembled an ancient gargoyle, with menacing horns protruding from its head and leathery wings folded up behind its back. Its eyes glowed with an eerie blue light, and its mouth was filled with razor-sharp teeth dripping with a viscous substance. I instinctively reacted by throwing all my weight against this hellish creature, sending both of us crashing into a nearby wall. I managed to kick it off and sprint down the corridor, trying to put some distance between us. This monster was unlike anything I'd faced before on my missions. It seemed to anticipate my actions with deadly accuracy. As it lashed out with claw-like fingers that scraped across the cement walls, leaving deep gouges, I realized that no amount of training or weaponry would be enough to take down this abomination. Throughout our savage battle across the warehouse's dimly lit halls, I stumbled upon more unconscious bodies, civilians who had ventured too close to the warehouse like moths to flame. Their injuries ranged from minor cuts and bruises to broken bones and serious gashes. My heart raced as I dodged and weaved between the beast's brutal assaults, desperately trying to stay out of reach. Though it inflicted excruciating wounds, cracking ribs, and slashing flesh as our fight intensified, there were moments when my quick thinking saved me from certain death. I bolted around another corner, trying to catch my breath as I fumbled with my phone. I couldn't understand why I hadn't called for help earlier. It was so obvious now. Panic had set in, and it clouded my judgment. Calling my unit was just one desperate, trembling dial away. Before I could complete the call, however, the creature was upon me again. In mere seconds it had torn through two other unconscious victims with savage precision. Lifeless bodies convulsed for a moment before lying still. The gruesome scene and the agonized screams echoed in my ears. I was running out of time and options. I desperately scanned a room filled with rusty machinery and discarded metal parts for something to use against the beast. A rusty pipe caught my attention. Not an ideal weapon, but it might be enough to buy some time. I grabbed the pipe and swung it hard at the creature's head as it lunged forward. The metal connected with a sickening crunch, but the monster seemed unfazed by my desperate attack. It reared up on its hindquarters and lashed out again, slashing through my arm with its deadly talons. My vision began to blur as blood poured from my wounds, but I managed to find cover behind a large piece of machinery. Muffled attempts were made at contacting my unit, and after what seemed like an eternity, they answered. Briefly describing the situation, concentration was required more than ever while trying to keep myself conscious. Help is on its way, came their reassuring reply before the line went dead. The creature screeched in frustration as it sensed my weakening state. Its attacks grew more reckless yet persistent. Weakened by blood loss but determined not to let myself die here or let this monster escape into society any further, I continued attempting to evade its vicious onslaughts. Finally, relief surged through me as I heard distant sirens. My unit had arrived, reinforcements to end this nightmare. The chilling realization of what the creature really was filled me with dread as it reared up for one last, brutal charge. The sound of gunfire erupted, jolting me back into reality. Heavy bullets rained down on the creature as I struggled to remain conscious. A deafening silence soon settled after the flashes of gunfire ceased, prompting me to peek and open my eyes. Both units and local law enforcement officers surrounded this deformed creature. 
Despite the reinforcement's intervention, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to this monster than met the eye. The scent of fear lingered even after the hideous creature was defeated. As I was loaded into an ambulance, one of my colleagues came to give an update on what they had discovered regarding the beast's origin. This thing, it's a vampirus infernalis, he whispered in disbelief. An ancient vampire demon hybrid thought to have gone extinct centuries ago. A chill crept over what little warmth I had left in my body. This realization brought more questions than answers, along with further horror as to how many more of these monsters might be lurking in the shadows, biding their time before striking at more unsuspecting victims. I was on the phone with my wife, Jane, discussing whose turn it was to pick up our kids from soccer practice. As a detective, I usually get caught up at work and always seem to lose track of time. Fine, I'll go get them, I said finally, trying to make light of the situation. I just hope they don't mistake me for a kidnapper. The day started ordinarily enough but taking note of how life can change course in a heartbeat had become one of those intricate habits that come with being in law enforcement. It was March 12, 2014, and I couldn't help but feel something was off in the air. The town's somber atmosphere was tangible. It felt like we were all holding our breath for whatever came next. An hour into my patrol shift, Surveying Jefferson Street in San Francisco, something unexpected happened, a strange, horrifying crime scene unfolded before me. The details were quickly communicated over the radio by fellow officers first on the scene. A seemingly random act of violence, two people attacked and mutilated just moments apart. In a twisted display, their mouths had been elongated into ghastly grins. Neither victim could utter anything coherent about their attacker's appearance due to the shock they were experiencing, and to top it off, they didn't even recall what had even happened to them. Gathering information about this unknown perpetrator was essential yet elusive. As days turned into weeks, more reports of this atrocious aggressor surfaced mutilating people with no common thread between them other than those terrifying twisted grins left on their faces after each attack. There was an escalation in my own frustration as I tried to connect the dots amongst these seemingly unrelated incidents when one night this voice crackled over the radio. He should be on Elm Street by now. Faster! Rushing out onto Elm Street myself with my heart pounding and headlights blazing, I barely caught up with the perpetrator as he darted into an alley. In the moment that I confronted him, I could barely make out his figure, a dark hooded jacket with a grotesque smile painted on it. He was tall and slender, eerily graceful as he moved while evading my pursuit. Wait for backup! My partner yelled over the radio. Don't go in there alone. Ignoring the warning, I rose to my feet and stalked after him. The rain-soaked pavement underneath seemed slick and dangerous as I drew closer to his position before finally tackling him from behind against one of those unforgiving brick walls. Within seconds, he managed to shed my grip and continue evading me with supernatural agility. As we traversed through the maze-like dark alleyways, I realized that our cat-and-mouse game had taken us into a warehouse district, where I found myself cornered within a rusted-out shell of a building. What do you want? I yelled at him when there was some distance between us, hoping that this demented, Smiley-faced individual had some sort of internal logic or reason behind these heinous acts. But the only response is distorted, 
grinning visage offered was a disconcerting laugh before he hurled himself at me with unnerving speed like some depraved apex predator ready to devour its prey. Desperately, I tried to dodge his onslaught, but I was no match for his speed. With each slash of his sharp claws, blood spurted from my arms and legs. I stumbled backward, barely avoiding being eviscerated. Pain shot through my body, yet my training allowed me to remain conscious and focused. What are you? I managed to scream, putting as much distance between us as possible. He paused for a moment, cocked his head to the side, then spoke in a cold and lifeless voice that sent shivers down my spine. I'm what your nightmares are made of. Suddenly... Police sirens wailed in the distance, growing louder by the second. His attention was drawn from me to the sound of approaching backup. In that split second, I saw my chance. Mustering every ounce of strength left in me, I stumbled towards the rusted-out shell of a storage container hidden behind piles of debris and squeezed myself inside, praying he wouldn't find me. He slammed into the side of the container with enough force to shake it violently. Panic tightened its grip on me as I realized there was no guarantee he wouldn't discover my frail and bloody form concealed within its metal walls. Before he could investigate further, the sirens grew deafeningly loud. My fellow officers had finally arrived on the scene. The mysterious attacker hesitated for just one moment before bolting away at an incredible speed. By some miracle, he had left me alive, albeit severely injured and now badly in need of medical attention. The backup officers rushed in to secure the area and tend to my wounds while they relayed what they saw, a man with a grotesque smile on his face running away from the chaos. Days later in the hospital, as I reflected on the harrowing experience, I received a visit from an old friend and paranormal researcher named Dr. Miles Kagan. I recounted the grisly details of my encounter, knowing that he might have insight into whatever creature nearly took my life. After carefully considering the facts and collaborating with his own network of experts, Dr. Kagan presented his chilling conclusion. The attacker was a malevolent entity known as the Smiler, a demon whose origins could be traced back to ancient Sumerian imagery. He explained that the Smiler infiltrated our world from some unexplainable dimension, feeding off the fear and suffering it inflicts upon innocent victims. Its purpose was not just murder but spreading terror, chaos, and pain wherever it roamed. I left the hospital a changed man, knowing that such creatures existed within our reality. My recovery was long and arduous, haunted by nightmares of reliving the gruesome attack. With every bandage I removed or suture I pulled out, I was reminded of what I had survived and wondered if I would ever encounter the Smiler again. In time, however, the town returned to normalcy. New cases piled up on my desk, shifting my focus away from chasing an unknown menace. Yet whispers still circulated about the night terrors continuing to haunt Jefferson Street. Dreadful tales of mutilated bodies with disfigured grins on their faces. And so, as a detective bent on protecting my town from the most sinister monsters lurking within the shadows we create ourselves, I wonder how long it will be before this demonic smiling presence returns to wreak havoc among us again. The terror remains etched in my memory, a reminder not just of what happened but of what may still come when least expected. It was supposed to be an easy job. My name is Gareth Thompson, and I'm a poacher of rare animals. Mostly, my work took me to exotic locations, 
where I dealt with dangerous creatures and even more dangerous clients. But that day, I found myself in the rural countryside, tracking down less conventional prey. I had been hired to find and capture a creature that was rumored to exist only in local folklore, but recent sightings led me to believe it might be more than just a myth. My boss had called me earlier today with the lead. He's a crusty, cigarette-puffing guy who never had much sympathy for anyone or anything, especially his employees. Gareth, he said exasperatedly over the phone. For once, can you please just try not to screw this up? As if it were my fault that these supposedly mythical creatures were becoming increasingly difficult to find. As the sun dipped below the horizon, I entered a dense forest that bordered an old farm on the outskirts of town. The eerie silence sent shivers down my arms. The only sounds were the crunching of leaves beneath my boots and the occasional distant hoot of an owl. It may have been unsettling for someone unfamiliar with my line of work. However, I've grown accustomed to it. I trekked further into the woods when I stumbled upon something unusual and gruesome, a trail of blood that led off into the underbrush. Curiosity won over caution as I followed it further into the darkness. Suddenly, I heard a noise ahead. It sounded like twigs snapping under someone's or something's weight. My heart caught in my throat as I slowly approached where the sound originated. Gripping my weapon tightly in one hand, I prepared myself for whatever came next. Through the moonlight that filtered down through the tree's branches, I saw movement, something large and bipedal stalking through the trees, hunched and dragging something heavy behind it. I couldn't make out any features, but I knew instinctively that this was no ordinary animal. It lingered near a small clearing, dragging its burden to the center. What happened next sent a shockwave of dread through me. The creature crept towards a figure lying motionless in the center of the clearing. It was a man bound and gagged, his eyes wide with terror as he struggled against his restraints. When I saw the beast looming over his helpless victim, I knew I had to intervene. I swallowed my fear and called out to the creature. Its head snapped in my direction with startling speed as it let out an unsettling growl. As it lumbered towards me, adrenaline coursed through my veins. The menacing figure closed in, and its true appearance was now clear, a monstrous blend of human and beast with twisted limbs covered with coarse hair. Its eyes burned like embers, and its gaping maw split its barely human face apart. The creature pounced just as I fired at it. The shot rang out through the night, echoing across the empty woods. It howled in agony as whatever makeshift weapon I was using left a gruesome wound on one of its monstrous limbs. But being wounded only made this beast angrier, even more formidable than before. It lunged again, attempting to claw at me, its teeth gnashing furiously as it sought blood. I knew I couldn't call for help. The remote location and potential disbelief from the authorities would render it pointless. I reached for my mobile anyway, but then realized that I had left it in my car. With each blunt blow to the creature's body, its grotesque deformation seemed to throb with rage. Horrifying snapping sounds emitted from its joints while its blood-tainted saliva drooled incessantly onto the ground. As the battle raged on, I could see the fear in the eyes of the bound man behind it growing more intense. At one point, as I struggled against the monstrous adversary, I chanced upon an instinctual solution. Quickly grabbing a branch from nearby, I lit it ablaze using a lighter I always carried with me. It wasn't much of a weapon, but with each chaotic swing at that horrifying visage, it seemed to become more fearful, shrinking back and biding its time. 
After several exhausting minutes of trying to keep the foul creature at bay, I saw another figure approach in the distance. His face was haggard, and his overcoat was heavily stained and torn in multiple places. Away with you! He screamed at the beast as he hurled an improvised Molotov cocktail from a glass bottle filled with gasoline. The creature recoiled violently as flames seared its grotesque skin. The stranger approached me with his hand outstretched in gratitude. You saved that poor man's life, he said in a gruff voice. If you hadn't intervened when you did, he would have been another gruesome kill. The name is Julian, he added as we got acquainted. Let me help you finish off this monster. There's no need, I replied, panting heavily and glanced over at where my horrific quarry lay writhing on the ground in anguish. It won't bother anyone else now. Do you know what it is? I asked Julian, filled with growing doubt and dread. He nodded gravely. Yes, he said. This is the folklore beast that has haunted these parts for generations. Locals call it Strigon, a creature with insatiable bloodlust for human flesh. Our eyes met for a moment of mutual repulsion and understanding. Despite the horrific ordeal we had been through, I couldn't help but feel sympathy for Julian, whose tormented gaze revealed an intimate knowledge of the monster's atrocities. After freeing the victim, I looked back at Julian and asked, how do we make sure Strigon doesn't attack again? With a mixture of sadness and resignation in his eyes, he responded, There is no way to kill it, only to delay it. It will heal itself and hunt again eventually. We can only remain vigilant. In the following days, we set about doing just that. With Julian's help, a makeshift trap was created to cage Strigon. Although a temporary solution, we managed to give the townsfolk much-needed peace. As time passed, life returned to a semblance of normality in the quiet countryside community, yet an undercurrent of unease lingered in the air. Seeing that my work here was done, I prepared to leave. Before parting ways, Julian warned me one last time. Strigon lives on. When it strikes again, be ready. An eerie chill settled down over me as I drove off into the distance, knowing that amidst those peaceful woods lay an undying evil just biding its time.